Okay. All right, folks. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to let folks into the meeting. We're live on Create TV. We've got folks trickling in. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Radhika Tandon. Um, welcome to the San Jose Museum of Arts Virtual Community Day celebrating Lunar New Year. Um, Lunar New Year started yesterday. It's the year of the ox. Um, and we're so excited for all the programming that we have today to share with you. Um, I'm the education program coordinator here at the San Jose Museum of Art. Um, and I'm so excited uh, for all the performers and all of our participants that are coming in to join us today. Um, what I want to do is just hand it over to the director of the San Jose Museum of Art. Uh, Sarah Batten, and I'm going to spotlight you so she can sh share some messages with us. Thank you, Radhika, and hello, everyone. I know some people are still trickling in, but welcome to SJMA's Virtual Community Day, Lunar New Year 2021, the Year of the Ox. Our community days are among, are among the most popular public programs hosted annually by SJMA, offered three times a year. This promotes cross-cultural understanding and brings people together with multi-generational content and a sharing, an opportunity to share cultural traditions. In fact, the Lunar New Year celebration at the museum always has the highest attendance pre-COVID. So we thank you for tuning in today virtually. At SJMA, we lost, launched an ambitious strategic plan two years ago to become a borderless museum, essential to cultural life among the diverse communities that we serve. This cultural celebration today presents a wonderful lineup of cross-disciplinary artists, poets, and performers from across the South Bay. And we even get to celebrate food. We can't kick off this program today without noting that there has been a surge in brutal attacks against Asian American seniors in the Bay Area, including one that resulted in the death of an 84-year-old Thai man. Many res residents are fearful and angry, and activists are demanding justice. At SJMA, we condemn this atrocious violence and all forms of discrimination against Asian Americans and stand with civic and social justice groups working tirelessly to protect our most vulnerable elders. On this wonderful occasion today, we celebrate Lunar New Year and wish you and your families safety, good health, and prosperity. It is now my esteemed pleasure to welcome the Honorable Ash Kalra, our assembly member, to kick off today's <laughs> meetings. Welcome, Ash. Thank you so much, Sire, and for everyone uh, at the museum, uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to see uh, the incredible events uh, that the museum hosts, usually uh, there in person, but uh, it doesn't surprise me one bit that you haven't skipped a beat and have moved, moved to an online uh, event here, especially for Lunar New Year, which is one of the most significant and important events in San Jose for all of us, not just for those that celebrate it within their own family. But I think so many of us that have grown up in San Jose uh, have grown accustomed to this celebratory time uh, in, in our city and in our community. And uh, there's no doubt that the celebrations at the Museum of Art um, that I've been to over the years, the multitude of cultural events uh, are really some of the best events that uh, the city puts on, especially that are accessible to the community. And the Lunar New Year uh, event certainly tops them all. And I, and I wanna thank you also for raising uh, the difficult issue of what's been happening, not just here uh, in the Bay Area, but throughout the country, certainly in California, New York, we've seen it. And frankly, we've seen it over the last uh, year to year and a half um, with the onset of this horrible pandemic that you've seen this rise in anti-Asian uh, racism, bigotry and attacks. And I think that as we enter this new year, let us see what we can do to start the year in a manner that uplifts everyone that, and that heals and, and, and supports those, especially the elderly, which, you know, being API, we all know the elderly in our community are the ones that uh, we are most obligated to protect and, and to care for. And so uh, in, in this year of the ox, 
uh, let's certainly hope that uh, we have a brighter year ahead, uh, especially uh, so that folks can be can have a happy um, and prosperous year, but most importantly, a healthy year. Uh, let's get healthy, let's stay healthy. I really hope, especially for so many of us that have not been able to connect with our family members, that at some point this year we, we reunite in a way that's safe and we can you know, really look to each other and look to one another um, for that um, sense of togetherness. I also wanna thank uh, the museum for the program today. I know that we're going to have um, a poetry workshop uh, and uh, Xu Chin Nguyen, who is a very accomplished San Jose poet, will be leading that. And I, the thing I love about Vietnamese poetry in particular, you know, poetry is, is, a, a, is an art form uh, that certainly draws so much out of emotion. And there's no doubt the Vietnamese community, especially uh, here in San Jose, can draw from so many different ranges of emotion based upon historical context, um, in, in terms of sacrifice and survival, but also resilience and strength and courage. And so I think the, the Vietnamese poetry in particular, especially having such a, a wonderful poet to lead the workshop is really something that I think everyone can enjoy. And I know you have a full, and the, the great thing about Lunar New Year is that it's a Vietnamese community, Chinese community, Korean community. And I know that all those communities are reflected in today's program. Uh, and we're also, you cannot have a Lunar New Year celebration without lion dancers. I know we have the Rising Phoenix uh, lion and dra dragon dance troupe that's gonna be performing. Uh, and we can't miss out on that. It wouldn't be the same. Even if you're not in the same room, there's no doubt you can feel the energy when you see a lion dance uh, performance. And so um, I certainly wanna thank everyone uh, for taking part today, for participating. I know there's folks on Facebook Live as well uh, as on the Zoom. And I just wanna end uh, by wishing you a wonderful year ahead uh, and for your families. Xin yin kuai le, sehe buk man hi parasayao, and Chikmang Namai. Happy Lunar New Year, everyone. Thank you so much, Sayer and Ash. Um, we're still waiting on one person to come in to finish our opening remarks, um, but I just wanted to give folks some time to trickle in. We are on Facebook Live and don't worry, this event will be recorded. So if you're really concerned about missing out, um, you're welcome to step away and check it out later on San Jose Museum of Arts Facebook page and our YouTube channel, and it'll come up a little bit later. Um, I just wanted to walk folks through what's going to be happening today. Uh, we're going to have the wonderful poetry workshop um, that Ash was mentioning, um, and then it's going to be followed by an open mic. Uh, so if you are really willing and ready to share, we're going to be uh, a nice open participant crew and ready to hear your poetry and your wonderful art forms in the written word. Um, we'll have a hands-on ox making activity, very fun. The museum always has um, the a hands-on activity for uh, whatever zodiac animal is uh, represented that year. And so we're gonna make a really cute ox. I've made one myself and I'm gonna make another one today cause I love it. Um, and then we're gonna have a rising Phoenix performance. They actually filmed in front of the museum for us to kind of bring back that uh, the feeling and the vibe that we have normally in person which we were so grateful for. Um, and then we have a wonderful, wonderful um, review of a, a photographic book on San Francisco's Chinatown. Um, we're gonna go through these beautiful images and stories of the folks that make up that community, which is great. Um, and then we have a really fun live children's book reading by Oliver Chin. He's written books on every zodiac animal and they're the most adorable, exciting stories. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, followed by uh, a dance tutorial by the Korean Cultural Center. Um, so if you're wanting to learn some traditional Korean dance moves, um, you can watch the video and then be guided gently through the performance. Um, it'll get you out of your seat too, if you're feeling like we've been sitting a little bit too long. So you'll have something to look forward to at the end of the day. And then we'll close out uh, with a wonderful uh, tutorial for a Vietnamese sticky rice cake that they normally eat on Tet. So um, I'm really excited for all, all that we are going to share with you. Um, let me check if Maya is here. If not, I wanna introduce uh, the folks that are co-hosting with me today. Um, let me add you onto my screen. All right. 
So I have wonderful gallery teachers and studio artists with us today from the San Jose Museum of Art. Um, I have Shannon Straub, Ali Fitch, and Rowan Bodentempo. Um, and you'll see them all throughout the event today, uh, helping me, uh, reacting to your wonderful art and poetry, uh, and you know, helping share the positivity that this is. <clears throat> So Shannon uh, is gonna be my first co-host for today. Uh, she's our senior studio artist here at the museum. She teaches uh, both at the museum and in classrooms. So maybe if you're joining us from one of her classes, you'll recognize her. Um, and she'll be my first co-host of the day. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Radhika. Now, this is my fourth Lunar New Year and I gotta say, I'm really excited for this new format. It's so cool to see everyone in this new way. Um, our first adventure for it, with the poetry making is being hosted by Trami and everything I've ever seen her do, super, super spectacular. And I can't wait to learn from her. Perfect. I, there's going to be different Vietnamese uh, poetry styles. And one of them is even uh, a UNESCO recognized uh, form of poetry. So if you're looking to you know, expand your horizons and your understanding of poetry, I think this Hidden Heritage Workshop is gonna be perfect for that. Um, all righty, folks. I'm going to actually hand it over to Trami right now. Um, and we can get started with our introductions. Trami. How you doing, Trami? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, happy New Year. I'm so happy to be here representing Chopsticks Alley and also uh, San Jose Museum of Art on this very exciting project called Hidden Heritages, where today we're going to be sharing with you some Vietnamese poetry. Just a little bit about Vietnamese poetry. It's really in our soul. It's not even something that we can choose. We're like kind of born with it. And even as children, we are taught poetry through lullabies and through just um, little sayings daily. So it's part of our, our soul. And why is that? It's because Vietnam is such a war-torn war country where we're constantly fighting or for our lives or escaping. And so the one thing we could always carry with us is everything that's in our minds, right? And our hearts, and that's poetry. So it's not like carrying a, a pottery or a painting or things like that, that you can easily carry from place to place when you're escaping from war but poetry is. And poetry is also very romantic. And I don't know um, if people think about Vietnam as a very romantic country, but it is, it truly is. And if you think of like, oh, you know, um, the stereotypes that, oh, in Latin America, the men are sexy, you know. Well, in Vietnam, we consider our men pretty <laughs> sexy, right? And that's because they're in their soul. It's, they speak and spew just poetry all day long. So let me share with you a little bit about um, Hidden Heritages. So what Hidden Heritages is a two-year partnership between the San Jose Museum of Art and Chopsticks Alley and the City of San Jose's Office of Cultural Affairs that brings Vietnamese artists and community members together to share, amplify, and artistically present stories that reveal the contributions of Vietnamese Americans to San Jose. Hidden Heritages is um, I'm going to say in Vietnamese, just in case we have a few folks who are Vietnamese out, out of respect, and then the rest of the program will be in English. Okay? Um, San Jose Vietnamese legacy ẩn dấu di sản Việt tại San Jose là dự án hợp tác trong vòng hai năm giữa San Jose Museum of Art, Chopsticks Alley và City of San Jose's Office of Cultural Affairs để hội tụ các nghệ sĩ Việt Nam với những thành viên trong cộng đồng lại gần với nhau nhằm mục đích chia sẻ, công bố rộng rãi và trình bày một cách nghệ thuật những câu chuyện để làm sáng tỏ các đóng góp của người Mỹ gốc Việt tại San Jose, một trong những những thành phố đa dạng nhất của California. So we would love for you uh, to hear from you. So follow us uh, on Hidden Heritage in social media, but also um, San Jose Museum of Art has a beautiful um, page link so you can see the final exhibit once we're done. So the agenda for today, um, to begin our class, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a young poet, An Boy, who will be uh, running the show. But actually, before that, let me introduce our um, oldest poet <laughs> that I know, 
Um, and he's here with us today. And that is um, poet Jin Nguyen. So, mời chú, nếu mà chú muốn nói vài lời. Yeah, thank you for Jami. I really enjoy the group because uh, I love it for talking with the young guy. Um, I love it talking about his um, poetry. And thank you, Jami. And thank you, everybody. Cảm ơn chú rất nhiều. So, um, he, you know, you understand. And I, we really uh, love that you joined us today. And if everyone can believe it, Mr. Jin, a poet Jin is over 80 years old. So the fact that he's on Zoom, that says that we can all be on Zoom, right? No more excuses. <laughs> so um, we are, this, this workshop was actually created by Chu Jin or poet Jin. And we have poet An Boy, who's the younger Vietnamese generation, who is going to be helping uh, run the, the workshop for us. So An, if you want to say hello to our audience, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Anne and Chúc mừng năm mới. Happy Lunar New Year. I'm so excited and honored to be leading this workshop that Jin <coughs> created um, and adapting it to English for you all. And just enjoying this morning, the second day of the new year with everyone today. So I can't wait to teach you and I can't wait to see your poems later. Yes, and I like to point out that we are both wearing Aozai, and you know, Ashkar, our um, a state assembly member, he was wearing one too. And they're they come in different forms, different necks, <laughs> different you know sleeves. So <laughs> An is wearing a boat neck one, and that was inspired by in the 1960s by the um, at the time the president's, I guess, the first lady of Vietnam, right? When she took on the Western style of um, Aozai, and I have more of the tradition traditional neckline. But actually, you know, the dress itself is not that traditional because it's kind of see-through and that's like not <laughs> tradition, right? Yep. It's a no -no. But today, <laughs> this is America, it's 2021, so we have to, you know, take it up a notch. So without further ado, let me introduce Ang more um, formally. So Ang is going to be reading a poem for us called New Year Wishes for My Little Brother. An Boy is a poet and youth worker who was born in Vietnam and raised in San Jose. So she's fluent in Vietnamese, and that's just amazing to us. She earned a BA at UCLA and served in the Jesuit Cor Volunteer Corps. Through her writing, she navigates family dynamics, queer Catholic Vietnamese identity, and grief. Really tough job. She has facilitated poetry reading, uh, writing workshops, and emceed open mics for retreats and community events throughout the Bay Area. So um, after the workshop ends, remember to stick around because between noon and 1230, we have an open mic. So she is a member of the Artists and Healer Collective called QT Viet Cafe Collective Circle. Her work has been featured in Auto Traddle, Kearney Street Workshop and more. When she's not writing, she's leading programs to support youth development dreaming of intergenerational healing with families and catching as many sunsets as possible. So Anne, with that, please take it away. Thank you, Jami, for the introduction. I have a poem for you all. Um, New Year wishes for my little brother. My little ox, the grief of losing you was so strong just one year ago. Now it comes softer, like gentle waves kissing the sands of your memory. Less survivor's guilt comes now, but sometimes the waves still crash down, longing to tell your story more than my own. Remember when you'd stay up with me? We'd catch up for hours after dark in the living room, our eyes barely winning against sleep as we talked about everything in life, from school to work, family to dating, activism to joy. You were determined to figure things out. This reconnection to our culture and family, rediscovery of your spirituality and purpose, revelation of who you are and who you want to be. Young adult male, fresh college grad, teacher in service, aspiring social worker. You didn't know where this path would take you, but you wouldn't hesitate to take the lead. This Lunar New Year, in your fellow oxen, I see the same hard work, dependability, desire to make something of yourselves. To you and your peers, I offer these wishes. May you take it steady and build your foundation 
Envision your future harvest with clarity so you know what seeds to plant. Take the time to till the soil and water the seeds. May you remember to keep an eye on them. Watch out for problems because they will arise. Learn how to ask for help and address the root cause. Don't get distracted by the symptoms. May you find comfort in knowing that problems can always be solved and you can always start over. There is plenty of soil, seeds, and time. What matters is that you don't give up and keep on moving. May you learn to celebrate the trials and errors that will strengthen your soil and soul. Before you know it, sprouts will emerge, gracing you with milestones worth embracing. This is just the beginning, my little ox. No matter what happens, your ancestors got you. Even as the most strong and stubborn animal in the zodiac, you need support and rest too. Because of their legacy, the love of those that stand beside you, your own courage and patience in the process, these plants, these dreams turned reality are possible. So remember, this is a year of sowing, not reaping. Spring is coming no matter how cold the winter was. So settle your dreams into place and trust me, you will marvel at all the ways you'll grow. Thank you. That is so wonderful. Thank you so much. It's such a perfect, um, uh, rendition of what an, an ox, the animal, means to us. And also, thank you for sharing uh, such an intimate story with you and your brother. Um, we really appreciate that. And um, such a message of hope, too. And that's just wonderful. Right, everyone? We love it. So we have to give her like virtual class. I know. Virtual, I hear the virtual staff, everyone. <laughs> you can hear them through your camera screen. <laughs> Definitely feel free to use reactions, you know, hearts, claps, thumbs up. We really appreciate the virtual environment. And if you're on Facebook, I know you can react too on the stream. So definitely feel free to use the chat in all those ways. <laughs> well, thank you. So without, you know, if you want to write poetry like this too, then you have to kind of learn some basics, right? So today, Ang is going to share with you some basic Vietnamese poetry. So um, we're going to have you take over, Ang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will share my screen right now. Perfect. Okay, everyone, welcome to Kai Gao, Journey Poetry and Life, a Vietnamese poetry workshop, again, created by Ju Jin Nguyen and presented by mm. myself, Ang Wu. Yes, Ju Jin, hello. So we're gonna get started uh, right in diving into it. So as Jami noticed, poetry, the importance of poetry is huge in Vietnamese culture, from history, culture, family, and a way of life. And as she mentioned, it was really important for Vietnamese folks to have poetry in our daily lives because it is a form of art we can carry with us no matter what war, colonization, and occupation we were going through from other countries. And in addition, it was also a way that people would flirt with each other because they considered it inappropriate to flirt directly. So they felt like it was better if you just recited poems to each other versus being straightforward. So it's really funny and interesting how it just kind of incorporated itself in the way of life. And the other important thing to note is that not only poets are poets in Vietnam, like everyone uses poetry in your everyday life when you're talking about beliefs you're teaching your children or even just talking about like how we live our lifestyle so poetry really is for everyone and it's so part of our everyday phrases that we don't even realize that we're using poetry to dive into more history of poetry I want to highlight some famous poets and poems and so on the left there's four famous poets uh Lee Thường Kiet, Đại Trần Côn, Nguyễn Du, and Ho Xuân Hương and what you'll notice actually about these names is that the last name is actually the first name, the last name uh, of our Vietnamese culture is actually the first name when you read it. So Vietnamese names were read from last name to first name, not first name to, to last name. So Lee is actually a last name. And these are their famous poems that they are really known for. And the one I really wanna highlight is the tale of Jit <coughs> Gil which was basically a 3000 plus verse poem about the trials and tribulations of a woman who had to sacrifice so much from her family to save her, to save her father and her brother from prison, even having to sell herself into marriage to do so. 
and what she did to overcome that struggle. So it's a really epic poem. And if you could choose one poem from this list to check out, that is definitely the one that I would recommend. Now we're gonna move into the four different poetry styles. So I'm gonna teach you four different poetry styles that we have. The first on the top left is called Tatngon Batku. Then we have Tu Tuyet on the top right. Then we have Song Tat Luk Bat on the bottom left. And last but not least, the star of the show is going to be Luk Bat, which is actually the poetic style that you are going to get the chance to practice writing today. So let's dive. Before we dive into it, though, everyone just type in the comments, like, how is poetry important to you? Like, how has poetry been important to your family, your culture, your way of life, or your history? I'm sure that we'd love to hear, even because we can't be in a room together, but we'd love to hear in the comments, like, how it's been important to you. Um, so that we can draw from that as well. Let me see if I can. I'm not sure if I could pull up the chat at the same time, but yes, I see honoring memories. I love it. Exploring emotions and experiences. Definitely a great use of poetry. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Oh, yeah, I see excitement. Yes, we're so excited to have you. So we're going to dive right in because I want to make sure there's time for you all to practice. And thank you for sharing that poetry allows me to process my feelings. All right, moving forward. Um, okay, so the first form is called Tatmon Batku, and this is an example of a poem. And what is distinct about this poetry style is that it is eight sentences, seven words each, because in Vietnamese, every word is just one syllable. So if you actually translate it to English, it would be more so seven syllables each. But in Vietnamese, because all our words are just one syllable, it's seven words. And so you'll notice here that's in the bold, the last word of each line is what rhymes with each other. So I'll just read it aloud so you all can hear it, and then I'll explain what the poem is about. So it goes like this. Vài hàng viếng, anh vi trần nhu, đang buồn tin báo, bác trần nhu, đá vội quy. Long cánh bỗng xù, vẫn biết luật đời, sinh có tử. Sớm tìm đạo pháp học và tu, viết ngàn trang, tố phường gian ác. Thường mấy người, xa cảnh ngục tù, quỷ dữ, gieo nhân thì hái quả. Cáo, cầy, kiếp kiếp, lũ hèn ngu. You can see the, you can hear how it rhymes the last words, right? Nhu, xù, tử, tu, ác, tù, quả, ngu. So it has that pattern to it. And this is actually a poem, it's actually a very sad poem about receiving news about someone that has passed away and remembering their own personal time when they were a prisoner of war um, in the re-education camps in Vietnam. So that's what this poem is about. And again, showing the different uh, aspects of life that poetry is about. This, so again, just to recap, eight sentences, seven words each, and the last word is what rhymes. The next poem style that we're going to review is Tư Tuyệt. So Tư Tuyệt is characterized by actually four sentences and still seven words each with the last word having a pattern with each other. I will read this poem for you all and it goes like this. Phuong đỏ, mùa sư chẳng đợi nhau, màu hồng tựa máu rỉ tim đau nhỏ trên mặt nước rung rinh sóng loan tận biển đông đấy vực sâu so nhau đau sống sau that's the pattern and this is another sad poem um, and it is actually about those who crossed the ocean and passed away and what that experience was like because you know a lot of Vietnamese refugees had to cross the ocean to try and escape the political conflict in Vietnam at the time. And so this was a poem about that struggle as well. Yeah. The next poetry style that we have for you all is called Song Thất Lục Bát. And this is similar to our final star poetry because poem style, because you see here Lục Bát in the title. Um, and this poetry style, if you may notice, is actually characterized by a more unique style than the others, where there are two sentences, seven words each, and then there's one sentence, six words, and then the last sentence is eight words long. So it's seven words, 
six words and then eight words. And the poem goes like this. Tình đã dứt thì thôi người nghe, chúc người luôn vui vẻ tròn đôi. Từ nay khác biệt phương trời, đêm đêm cô lẽ trang rơi bẻ bàn. And this poem is actually a love lost poem and it's about a speaker. It's about a speaker who is wishing their old love all the best and feeling a little lost whenever they gaze at the, at the moon. And Agnes, I see your question, why all these sad poems for Lunar New Year? And you are pointing out a great point. And I think because so much of poetry, right, as someone mentioned earlier, is expressing our, uh, our emotions and our experiences. And because Vietnamese people are so expressive people, we have so many poems about the sad things in our life. And that's how we bring them to the light and talk about it rather than burying it, you know, burying it in our subconscious. So I think because of all the struggle we have been through, but also the ways we overcome it, it has shown up in our art. So those are why those are the examples here. I know there are probably, there are definitely a ton more of happy poems as well, but you just can't help but feel the juiciness, you know, of those like sad and heartbreaking songs that really touch or poems that really touch to the human soul. But I do appreciate you pointing that out because we do have more happy poems. And last, yes, definitely. And as Din Mai noted too, like the end of the war was marked in 1975, which is not that long ago, even though now in 2020, it feels like 50 years ago, but the wounds and the healing is very much still present. So without further ado, Look Bat is our final poetry style that I will be teaching you today. And Lukbat is actually also known as Sao Tam, which means six, eight, because it's characterized by one sentence that's six words, the, se the second sentence that's eight words, and then it repeats six, eight, six, eight. And for Lukbat, there actually is no limit to how many verses you can have. Um, it can just go endlessly. And the rhyme pattern, I put it here because we're gonna learn how to write it. So basically the last word, the sixth word of the, the sixth word will rhyme with each other in the first two lines. And then the last word of the second line is gonna rhyme with the last word of the following line. So I'll read the poem for you and the translation is right there too, although it's transliterated. So the rhyme pattern doesn't carry over, but here's the poem. Đường xa thì thật là xa, mượn mình là mối cho ta một người. Một người mới tám, đôi mươi, một người vừa vừa tươi như mình. So if you notice in that poem, the words that rhyme is sa and ta from the first and second. And then from the second and third, we have mười and mười. And then from the third to the fourth, we have mười and tươi or mười and tươi. So there's some slant rhymes in there too. You'll notice, right? Because they're not like exact <laughs> rhymes, but they are slant rhymes. Oh, thank you, Tutin. <laughs> yeah, and as you can see in the translation, it's a it's a love poem. So this is the happy love poem where the speaker is saying, the long road is really long. I ask you to find me a match, one who is 18 or 20, one who has, is as pretty and cheerful as you. So a young lover asking to also be set up with another lover, which is perfect for New Year and perfect for romance as well. Yeah, cool. So we are gonna keep going into more examples of look back. So and one of the most common ways you'll see look back show up in Vietnamese poetry is in ga yao. And ga yao are proverbs and they are songs passed down by words of mouth and activities of the people. Oops, sorry y'all for my screen. Um, and what they, and what the word ga yao means is literally song and, sorry. It literally means short songs and unfixed melody. So ga means song and yao means short unfixed melody. And when it's talking about like the village life and everything that's happening in the village, there's kind of like a, another label that calls it phong yao. And when it's talking about like children and raising children, there's a subcategory called dong yao. So that is the, the importance of ga yao. And the content is really rich, like, way back it's super traditional it just tells about our philosophy so a lot of times it's how you raised your family to understand your customs and beliefs in 
and talking about activities for children, as Jamie mentioned in the beginning, lullabies as well. And for generations, it was actually historically sung, um, which is also what that um, old art UNESCO, historic UNESCO art form um, that Ratika was mentioning from the beginning. But over the years, less people have acquired or practiced that sing song skill for our poetry. So nowadays, more people will actually just speak it or read it aloud, similar to how I read it for you all today. And so with the gaiyao, we're actually going to list it for here's another example of some gaiyaos. So I will read the I'll read them for you and then explain what they can mean. So ta ve ta tam ao ta zu chong zu du. That's the one on the top left. We return to bathe in our pond. Clear or murky, our pond is still better. And the meaning of that gagao and that proverb is basically meaning that there is no better place than home or your own place, even though your own place may not be as clean as someone else's place. So it's that tenderness of the familiarity of your own space. And the one on the bottom right, I will read, and it goes like this. Non, ba cây chụp lại nên hôn núi cao. One tree can't make a mountain. Three trees together form a high mountain. And what that gagao means is that alone you cannot do as much, but together you can achieve so much more, and you are so much stronger together. And so that really speaks to the collectivist culture of Vietnamese culture, where we are so focused on the community and recognizing that we are here and our life has value, not just for ourselves, but also to be part of this community together, which is such a beautiful aspect of Vietnamese culture that you definitely see in the poetry. Yeah, Do, uh, put in the comments below as you read these proverbs and ga yao, like which one is your favorite? Are you really loving the pond one? The loving the one about the person leaving and the toothy smile, about the deep river or about the trees? I'd love to know which of these four Kayao poems like you feel like you really are enjoying today? Nice, yeah, seeing the pond one, getting a lot of popularity. Yep, the strength of togetherness is a great one as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love, I'm seeing excitement from you all about getting excited to try this style. Um, and definitely the reflection about why so much of our art reflects our pain and the darkness and the desire to pull that out. Thank you all for those amazing, amazing reflections and sharing. Keep on feeling free to share in the chat. We're gonna move on now to hear some uh, sing song examples of these gay yao. So I'm gonna go to this side and this poem before I play it is called Le Book Sang Ngang, which translates to A Girl's Anxiety Before Marriage by poet Nguyen. And I'm only going to play a minute of this poem because it's quite long. Um, but basically, before you hear it, she is singing. So traditionally in Vietnamese culture, when a woman gets married to a man, she joins his family. And she then is responsible for taking care of his family and can't really have as much obligation to take care of her own. So this is about a girl who she loves her mom so much. And her mom is aging and she's just worrying because she knows when she gets married, She's not going to be able to prioritize taking her mom, care of her mom because she has to take care of her husband's family. So I'm going to play it for you all so you can hear it. Uh, here we go. Em ơi, em ở lại nhà Vườn dâu em đôn mẹ già Em thương Mẹ già một nắng hai sương Chỉ đi một bước trong đường xót xa Cậy em, em ở lại nhà Vườn dâu em Okay, awesome. So that was that poem. You can hear even in the, the music and the strings, the 
yes, Radhika, like the sorrow and the haunting and just like all those anxieties of a girl knowing she cannot be fully present to her aging mother once she gets married. And also insight into Vietnamese culture as well and the gender expectations of different people when they get married. Okay, and now we actually have a special live performance um, by poet Din Nguyen. And this is another way that Gayao shows up, which is in the lullaby, which in Vietnamese is called by Hat Ru Con. So, Chu Chin, Chao Mời Chu, Để Trình Diễn, by Hat Ru Con. I'm inviting him to the stage now to perform his live uh, lullaby. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I try the best to do it, uh, the kind of uh, sing, yeah, for my mom, I sing for uh, her kids living, okay? So now I can try the best to do it. Ah, 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 Lòng cung trầm tưởng ngỡ hoang mơ vì à tình Thi nhân chữ nghĩa lung linh Giọng ngâm giường đã tập tành nấu à nay Tiếng tư réo rắt đông đầy Kiếp sau vẫn nhớ những ngày đã yêu à, ơi, à, ơi. Thank you for your hit. <laughs> yeah. Everyone give heart reactions, thumbs up to two ten, please. Yeah. <laughs> What else is that one? Yeah, that is that one is uh, uh, um, the beautiful tree from the member of the Vien Vietnamese agriculture in the San Jose. She wrote it, so I I try to bet I did a six six A right. You know, really, you know, six A uh, poetry. So, Thank you very much, Ju Jin. I would like to share with the audience a little bit about um, poet Jin's background. His um, pseudonym is, his name is actually Han Wing Jung. Um, so Jin Wing is his pseudonym. He served in the South Vietnam Air Force and came to the United States as a communist refugee in 1975. He ended up working at IBM as a test engineer for over 20 years and has of course retired. And he is currently the chairman for Vang Thơ Lạc Việt, which is a Vietnamese and poetry and literary organization in San Jose. And he also hosts his own talk show um, on various Vietnamese TV and of course, YouTube. And what you're hearing, um, the song there is quite incredible because I grew up with my grandmother singing these songs to me. And you, you're hearing a type of rhythm that from all these things that you know, An played the video and now when poet didn't perform, these are all different rhythm of um, reciting poetry. You're gonna hear other rhythms too. And with each type of poetry you recite it within a particular rhythm. And these rhythms are is what's recognized by UNESCO as part of the um, Vietnamese heritage. Thank you. Back to you, An. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dami, for sharing that context and about Chu Jin's background. And thank you again. Come on, Chu Jin Mio. That's your say. By Hat Rupan. It's such a treat to be able to hear a live lullaby uh, from an elder, especially that we cherish in the community. So we already had a lullaby. Oops, sorry. We're going to skip this video because we had a live performance from the lullaby. And the last song example I want to show you all is called Hat Yao Zuyin which translates to singing love songs back and forth. This is by the Bac Ninh folk performers and Bac Ninh is a neighborhood actually in Vietnam. So in Vietnam, they have like a lot of neighborhood pride, similar to how we have neighborhood pride in San Jose. So actually on that note, why don't you drop what neighborhood you're from in San Jose and that you're repping today so we can see how we're all coming together to celebrate the Lunar New Year, whether you're representing like East San Jose or Evergreen or West San Jose, 
or Blossom Valley, or, you know, I know I'm still learning all the different names, even though I've lived here all my, most of my life. But yeah, I see it. Okay, Cambrian, Willow Glen, East Bay, cool. Nagley Park, someone coming in from Oregon. I love it. I love it. Thank you all for representing your neighborhood in San Jose. It's so Santa Cruz, awesome. And in Santa Clara County and the South Bay. That is so cool. Thank you all for sharing. Okay, now I'm gonna share a snippet of this video so you can see what that courtship looked like uh, because people considered it too much to straightforwardly flirt. So here we go. pause it there but as you can see they don't like talk at the same time one side has to share all their verses first and how they want to court the other side and then the other side gets to go and respond and they go back and forth and you'll notice both of them are also wear wearing traditional clothes as well so it's just a really cool way I feel like it's more it's very romantic and it's very intentional right you can't just come out of nowhere with your cheesy pickup line like you gotta come up with a poem if you want to Court someone today in Vietnam. <laughs> so it just shows that intention behind it as well. Now, without further ado, it is your turn to get writing and to start practice. So I hope now's a chance if you haven't already to grab your piece of paper and your writing utensil. And what I have is I actually have three different prompts for you all to um, write the poem. And we're going to give everyone actually 10 minutes to write. So we'll come back at 11.45 so that we can get here, you all share some poems. And of course, we know we're not looking for perfectionism here. We're just looking for you to tap into your story, tap into what you are really feeling like sharing your voice about today in regards to these prompts. Um, and this is a safe space to share. So we're not here to judge and we're just here to support each other and celebrate the new year. So the three prompts that you could possibly use is one, Write a ga yao about your family's activities, habits, beliefs, or way of life. And as you remember, a ga yao is a proverb, and the rhyme pattern is six eight. So one sentence with six syllables, second sentence with eight syllables. And make sure that this, and I'll have a rhyme pattern for you down here where you have the six word rhyme, and then you have the eighth and six word rhyme. So my rhyme is little brother, I wish for you to swim and fish for life catch it all except strife, sing to the beat of fifes and drums. So you're gonna follow by syllables since English words are more than one syllable. Another uh, poetry prompt for you all is write a look back poem about a new year's wish you have for someone in your family. So look back poem again, six, eight, and it's very traditional in our new years to give new year's wishes to folks. So that's where I had that poem. And then the final poem prompt for you all is to write a look back poem about your favorite hidden gem in San Jose, because Hidden Heritages is also about celebrating the Vietnamese American contribution and in general, our contributions to San Jose. So I would love to hear too, what's a cool poem to, that you could share to someone who maybe your poem is the first time they're learning about San Jose or your family, and what would you wanna share? And as a reminder about the first prompt, which is the Gai Yao poem, Ga yaos are typically only two sentences. So it's just one six and then one eight. So you can write like several different ga yaos or you can write like a longer form poem in a look back style, it's up to you. 
But for now, I will give you all 10 minutes to write and play some background music. So we'll check back in at 11.45 a.m. with your poem. So let me play some music now for you all. Let me just play. This. Thank you so much, Anne, for uh, oh. leading our audience to this. This is so sweet. <laughs> and I think to yeah. make it easier, because I'm like not a poet, uh, yeah. it'd be easy just to start with two lines. So the first line is six syllables. The second line is eight syllables. And make sure that the rhyming, how she taught you. Um, I think we start there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so while Anne um, gets her music ready, I just wanted to um, share with you like how amazing it is for us to be able to share our poetry. And we really appreciate the San Jose Museum of Art for giving us some airtime during Community Day. And if you ever had a chance to go to Community Day in live, um, you know, last year, it was just so amazing. It's just a tradition that we love uh, that SJMA is doing for the community and seeing everyone's faces and wearing their best outfits and of course lots of selfies it's always super fun <laughs> yeah thank you Demi for sure I missed that all right y'all let's get to writing with our pen I'll play some background music
moment. So I am going to slowly bring us back. Definitely add that last rhyme that you were thinking about for um, your poem and Gaiyao. And that's okay. It's okay if you didn't make it rhyme. It takes practice. But what's most important to um, outside of the poetry style is really the story and the message of the poems and how they're tapping into your experiences, your family's experiences, or your wishes for others. So actually now in our next um, five or five to 10 minutes, we want to give a space for people to share their poems with everyone in the group and to unmute yourself. So please, we would love to hear your poems. Again, this is a safe space, a no judgment zone, and just not expecting perfection at all. Although I'm sure you all have written some really beautiful poems about your, your family and your life. So uh, yeah, please let me know um, and feel free to just unmute yourself if you're able to, so we can hear your poem or your kaya. Um, I'd like to share, this is Renee Shell. Yes, Renee, please go ahead. I'll go ahead and put my video on. It's so great to see you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm a second grade teacher in San Jose and I have um, a lot of Vietnamese students. So that's why I tuned in today and I'm a poet, I love poetry. So here's my poem. Uh, it's about a hidden gem in San Jose called Oak Grove Park. Woodpeckers, Oak Grove Park, not a robin, lark, or crane, but your heartfelt pain falls like leaves, like rain. Thank you. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much, Renee. Let's give Renee our hearts, our reactions, our affirmation. It definitely takes courage to share on a virtual event. And I love Asela that you wanted to go next. Please feel free. The mic is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for this event. And um, I just realized I wrote a, a look bat. I hope I pronounced that right. Look Perfect. Bat. Awesome. So I realized that and still we're fine, but OK. To my mother, I hope. You'll venture to your home again. Speak yourself how you want. Walk to your dreams to Tokyo. Dry your tears from your pain. And feel safe to say, I am back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beautiful. I love that homecoming poem and wish to your mother. That is so sweet and tender. Love it. And so everyone knows Asela is a poet. Um, and she has worked with Chopsticks Alley before. She's like amazing. So to have you here is a great honor for us. So thanks for showing up. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. Would anyone else like to share? Let me go to the chat in case someone else put it on there. They want to share. You can feel free to unmute. Oh, and I also see people Ooh. writing in the chat box some of their poems. Oh, Jujin, did you say something? No. <laughs> okay, okay. Just checking. I did, I did. I just poetry when I'm sick, I... <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. I can read that for you, look at. Yeah, sure, you can. You want to share one quê hương, poem? Quê hương xa thẳm muôn trùng Ước mong mai mốt trùng phùng với em Wow, so should wow. I translate? Yes, um, please. So literally, it's um, um, my country is so far, far away and I hope to be reunited, you loved one soon so it's a love poem who are you missing <laughs> fashion time Who's it's like our, it's our example <laughs> I think about it when i 18 years old <laughs> oh. yeah <laughs> i love it so your and, your love when you were 18 that's sweet yeah yeah um, Anne, would you it. like to read um the poem that Saul posted on the chat yes i will read that um for you all to my lovely wife where would my life be without you you are the breath of fresh air, driving the blues away with your smile. Your fragrance can be felt for miles. I thank the Lord for you being in our life. Such a sweet poem. Thank you so much for sharing. So, so much love in this room. Yes, so much love. Um, definitely feel free to continue sharing in the chat. Would anyone else like to share uh, unmuted for the whole group? Um, if you want on while we're waiting for the next one, I can read a couple of Vietnamese proverbs with that. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. So this one is um, 
so on chopsticksalley.com, we have a bunch of Gaia that we posted. Um, I'm trying to find a positive one. I guess we're very bitter people. I don't know. <laughs> so this one's about, um, it's called Meo Heng, Meo Yai Dui. It's a, it's a quick proverb, so it's only one sentence. It, it means um, the cat is saying how long my tail is. So it speaks to, a, you know, being self-centered, right? So a cat, like, bragging how long his tail is. Um, I love Vietnamese proverbs and these sayings because it's just like a way of um, criticizing without being in your face, right? It's very subtle. Really, it's talking about a cat. What's the big deal, right? But there's this deeper meaning. <laughs> yeah. I have, I noticed one more poem in the chat that I wanted to share from Agnes. And it goes, far away you may be, in both cups we drink tea from home. Thank you for that short and sweet and very tender poem about that. I really like that one. That's very sweet. Oh, Jin Mai would like to share. Yes, Jin Mai, the mic is all yours. Hi, this was so difficult <laughs> to be limited to such a short, uh, yeah, um, amount of words. Or I went, I did the syllables. Um, Wounds of generations throughout our lands and our nations, weeping soil of mother, seeping in the toil of brother, we carry together, heavy stone as light as feather. I lift a prayer of peace to sift through Maya and trees. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jin Mai. For everyone, um, Jin Mai is one of our main artists in the Hidden Heritages project. And she has um, created a, a few workshops for us in, in the culminating of the final uh, exhibit. She and um, artist Bindan will be a huge part of that. And they're working on that together. Thank you for being here today. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that deep poem. And I like how you said that this was challenging and then you just like whipped out this amazing, beautiful deep poem about our, <laughs> our, our, like, our experience and our struggle. So thank you for that. And I loved it. Well, we have time for one more sharing, whether that is in the chat or live. So I wanna pass the mic to anyone who would like to do that before we close out our workshop and transition into the open mic later today. I have another proverb to share while we wait. Um, this one's a little longer and it's, it goes like this. Ở sao vừa được lòng người, ở rộng người cười, ở hẹp người chê. So the direct translation is, how can we please everyone? Live lavishly and they will laugh, live frugally and they will condemn. So another statement about society, right? You can't please everyone. But I, I just love the rhythm and the up and down, the, it's very musical, right? That's the Vietnamese language is very musical. It's like built in um, rhythm. I love it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gemma. Oh, I want you to share. Yeah, I think. Oh, yeah. Rowan, I would love to hear from you. Hello. How is everyone? So I was very inspired by your poem about your brother. Mm -hmm. um, I have a younger sibling as well. So I'll, I'll share my small poem. V, my younger sibling. I hope for you to sing with pride, your new voice, a new fire. Oh, live life and never tire. Mm. Mm. I love that. I can feel the love for your sibling in that poem for sure. Thank you, Rod. And thank you everyone so much for writing with us and sharing your poem, your Gayao or Look Back poem today, whether it was through the chat or through uh, the mic live. And we just want to give you all some contact information to stay in touch with us, whether you want to keep in touch with me, Poet Jin Nguyen, Chopsticks Ali Art, or San Jose Museum of Art. These are the different ways you can contact us. And yes, definitely echoing Jin Mai, where Du Jin is the true poet. He is the original creator of this entire workshop, and I just adapted it into English for you all. So let's definitely give him our love and round of applause for keeping Thank Vietnamese you. culture and poetry alive here in the diaspora. Thank you yeah. so much, Ang, for doing such a great job. We really appreciate you um, joining us today and, and creating and translating it and, and modernizing it. 
Um, if you don't mind, stop sharing screen. That would be mm -hmm. really helpful for us. Definitely. Um, as we introduce the next little segment, right? And of course, thank you, Ju Jin, for being a part of this incredible, um, you know, workshop. And I know you've had some, um, you know, struggles. And it's so great that you were able to join us. And we're like, it's like such a proud moment for us, you know, younger generation to be supported by the older Vietnamese generation in what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we have a very important speaker uh, that is waiting in the green room for to come up next, right? So we're going to um, ask everyone to stick around because we're going to have a uh, open mic, which starts at what time, Ang? It starts at noon. At noon. Yeah. So um, I think I'm going to give the mic back to Radhika. Oh. <laughs> Hi, folks. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just keep talking right now uh, until someone can spotlight me really quick. Um, but thank you so much for this workshop. Uh, it was amazing. What I want to do uh, is for everyone that was here is to direct you to the chat really quickly. Um, there's a link to a survey for this workshop, and we would love to hear your thoughts on um, your experience for, for this first part of our Lunar New Year celebration. Um, I want to thank all the participants, your poetry was just beautiful. Um, I wasn't expecting that this morning. And so it's really nice to feel all that love and, and all those emotions come in and being shared with this wonderful group. Um, and I want to thank Trami and Jin and, and for leading this wonderful workshop and introducing a part of your culture to us that we can you know, bring forward and learn from. Uh, throughout, throughout our, uh, our experiences in our lives. Um, what I want to do really quickly uh, is introduce council member Maya Esparza, who is going to share a few words for us um, to kind of round out all the wonderful things that are gonna happen today. And let me just spotlight you. There you go. Um, and I'll, I'll get out of your way there. There you go. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. I, I loved it. I'll spare you my uh, Kayao uh, poetry. I need more practice, um, but really uh, appreciated learning about the poetry and listening to the beautiful um, poetry and proverbs today. Thank you so much for giving all of us that opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to say quickly, Happy New Year. Um, and uh, this is uh, the Lunar New Year is in many cultures, a time to come together and appreciate family, friends, and community. And it's a time to reflect, but also to turn the page on an old year and welcome the new spring with hopes of good fortune and the chance to face the challenges of the coming year with renewed optimism. And so I think we could all could definitely use some renewed optimism in 2021. And uh, I'm feeling particularly hopeful about the coming year. And uh, also wanted to share that I'm really excited about our performers today. Thank you, An, for uh, teaching us about poetry and proverbs and your beautiful poem um, about the little ox. Um, I really actually, I, I love the whole thing, but the line about the ancestors, um, was uh, very moving for me. Um, I know that later today we are in for a rich discussion about the history of San Francisco's Chinatown, an exciting reading from our local comics expert, Oliver Chin, and a couple of great tutorials and demonstrations from the Korean Cultural Center, Urisawe and Chopsticks Alley. I wanna brag for just a brief second um, about the Chopsticks Alley cooking demonstration on Tet Sticky Rice Cakes. Trami is actually, um, represents District 7 on the City Arts Commission. And uh, exactly, shout out to Trami. Um, I'm very, very proud and honored to be a partner in uh, Chopsticks Alley to see the work um, in their in the community today as we go into the new year, but really throughout the year, um, Chopsticks Alley has done some amazing things in the community with COVID um, and really give it inspired uh, kids and families and hope, um, which you do all the time. Thank you again for everybody giving me the opportunity to be here. Thanks to all the folks who came in uh, to experience this beautiful poetry workshop. Now is the time to come together as a community and celebrate. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, Council Member Esparza, for your wonderful reflection and words. And we also want to make a shout out to Council Member Esparza for last year, she um, funded, a partially funded uh, Chopsticks Alley's efforts to donate 500 art kits to the community, to kids and to health centers because it's so much needed for our mental health. So really thank you for taking care of the community. So we were going to leave, um, end this poetry workshop with a few words for you today. And just remember this. So this is the year of the ox. The ox has traits of strength, reliability, fairness, and conscientiousness, as well as inspiring confidence in others. So it is perfect for 2021, right? So stay for the open mic session, which, which will begin soon. And um, as far as Shop 6 Alley, we will see you at 2.30, where myself and Aline Nguyen will be sharing a recipe mm -hmm. with you and show you how to make ban jung for Lunar Thut New Year. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again so much. Um, what we're going to do is transition to our open mic, but I know we've just been hunkered down and practicing our poetry. So I want to give folks a break to stand up um, and get out of their seats, you know, stretch a little bit. So I'm going to share a presentation that Anne and I have prepared just to get you um, reoriented with our schedule and what the open mic will be like. Uh, and we'll come back at 12.05 uh, and get started with the open mic. So if you have any poetry that you want to share or if you have some more from the workshop that you've written up, we really encourage you to stick around. Um, and, and we'll be sharing a, a Google form so you can sign up. Um, and it looks like we do have some folks that have some poetry or, or poems to share. So we're really excited to hear it, but I want to give you all a break. Um, so come back at 12.05 and we'll get started right up again. All right. Thank you, folks. And for folks that are here with us, I added a Google Forms link. Um, That'll just give us a nice order for who wants to perform. So if you're really itching to go, make sure you click that link in the chat. Um, and sign up with your name just so Anne and I have an idea of who's ready to go and who's maybe waiting until the very end of the open mic to share their poetry today. All right. And again, this is a reminder, we just had our poetry workshop. Um, and our open mic is about to start and we'll have some hands on art. Um, a video recording from Rising Phoenix, uh, our Chinatown chat for San Francisco's Chinatown, uh, the dance and tutorial from the Korean Cultural Center Urasawe, uh, and then finally that delicious sticky rice cake that we're all looking forward to. <laughs> Um, and remember, if you're ever sharing anything um, from this event with your Instagram feed, with your Facebook, with your friends in your regular group chat, you can use the hashtag uh, LNYSJMA or our museum hashtag, see what you think. Um, you can tag us at the San Jose Museum of Art. There's underscores between all the words. Um, and we'd love to see any of the work that you produce today, whether it's poems, um, food, your dances, or uh, even the little ox that we're going to make in a short moment. All right, folks, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And. Cool. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ratika. Thanks for the spotlight. Well, welcome everyone to the Lunar New Year Open Mic. Woo! <laughs> Want to hear your cheers? If you're unmuted, or if you mute, or just show your excitement with reactions and in the chat. Normally, we'd be all like in person, and you could really feel the energy. So we have to like amp it up online somehow. So to tell you a little bit about the history of open mic. So actually. Open mics, it, and it's perfect because not only is it Lunar New Year, but it's also Black History Month. And that, and that is actually where the open mic tradition comes from. It's from the Black community here in the United States, and, and in particular, not only in the United States, but the diaspora too, from a lot of folks in the Caribbean, and being inspired by Black American artists at the time. And that's also my introduction to poetry, is through the, the Black community here too, in the Bay Area. So I just want to shout out to the history um, and that beautiful connection between Lunar New Year being here today for the open mic and Black History Month. So as we have some folks signing up and just to set the stage before we go in, 
I wanted to teach you all how to react because it takes a lot of courage to share your story, share your voice on the mic. And we need a lot of love and in the virtual environment. We need extra amount of love. So I just want you all to think, okay, for example, let's say that your mom or your dad or your parent just made the most amazing meal of your life. And what would you say, like, what would be the sounds and reactions if you just had this most amazing meal of your life? And for me, what I would go is like, mm, yes, that was awesome. So that's how you want to react to these poems where you want to go from your deep belly of appreciation of like, yes, like I felt that or like, that was amazing or wow, or quoting something from their poem or giving reactions like, heart reaction like I love that or clapping emoji I really felt that or like laughing emoji like that really made me laugh so I just want to uh, encourage you all to react to all our poets as they do come and share their piece with all of us today and just to get us started I will share a quick poem before we go to our first poet and so on deck we have Asela coming after me but to get us started I'll share this poem for yourself it's untitled um, and I wrote it back in 2016. What do you believe in? I believe in the power of acceptance, the warm embrace of presence and the necessity of life lessons. What do you believe in? I believe in overcoming fear, treasuring those you hold dear, recognizing what draws you near. What do you believe in? I believe in love above all things, simplicity over golden rings and truth discovered despite the sting. Thank you all so much again for joining us all here for the Lunar New Year Open Mic with San Jose Museum of Art. And I'm bringing onto the mic now Acela. So please everyone give your cheers in the applause, in the chat and reactions for Acela. And on deck after Acela, we will have Renee. Woo, Acela! Woo, on! <laughs> Yay! Hi, thank you so much for this open mic. I'm so excited. It's been a minute since I've been in open mic. So real quick, this poem I'm about to read is from a writing challenge that I'm doing right now this month. Just a personal writing challenge to write poems every day. And this is one of them. So this is from last year and it's called Ancestors. When I speak to my ancestors, they only hear gibberish. My mom didn't grow up looking up for God, but she always felt her relatives, bloodline, washed over all of us. Since then, I believe in this more than a guy in a white robe. I sometimes try to talk to them. Every night, I hold my hands together, whisper through my fingers towards the ceiling of my thoughts and tears, if the life I'm leading is the right one at least guiding me to where I'm closer to happiness. I keep promising myself that I'm going to master Japanese and Korean, as if I didn't put BTS's discography on loop and maybe with a song or two, they might understand. My dad is up there with my ancestors, but I'm sure even he wouldn't know what to say to them. All they can hear is scouted words, I can only hear their silence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isela, for sharing that incredible poem. I really felt that promise to continue learning one's language through pop music, which I really love that BTS shouted as well. Everyone, again, please give your love to Isela for sharing their beautiful poem with all of us. Yes, drop in the line if you had quotes that you all had. Up next on the mic, we have Renee, and on deck after Renee is Jin Mai. So, Renee, you are on the mic. Thank you. This is called For Kaylin, Who Likes Maps. Perhaps it is the bird's eye view that fascinates her, or the way one small finger can cover an entire country. How easily it reads the purple curves of Vietnam the jagged coast where water comforts jungle. Here is where they lived, she says, then there was a war. The rest, I imagine, her parents fleeing, how they miss the green, this land too dry. At home, the rice paddies. Here, 
their daughter hesitates in Vietnamese. In the classroom, we add, we subtract. Her fingers help her count. Her parents count too, the years since home, the ages of their children, their blessings, their losses, the blossoms on the strange tree in the parkway. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Renee. I felt that so deep in my heart, the stories and experiences of your, your students and just like the attention and compassion you have for them. That was such a beautiful testament to their families, histories and lineages. So thank you for sharing that. I'm so glad we got to meet you today as a fellow poet in San Jose and such an amazing teacher. Shout out to you for everything you're doing for the students right now. Can we just give Renee a shout out for doing everything to support her? Oh, thank you. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We're studying poetry right now and I cannot wait to teach them the look bat that you taught us. So thank you Yay! so much. That's so exciting. I'm so glad to hear it. Thank you again, Renee. Everyone give your love to Renee in the chat and any yes. reactions and, and up. Oh, and yeah. Sorry, uh, for Renee, if she wants our slide deck, we can share them with her. Oh, yeah. And if yeah. you need them for your students. Yes. So if you want, shoot us an email at chopsticksalley at gmail.com. I'll put it in the chat and you can send us an email. And we'll make sure you get the slides. Yeah, definitely. All right, up next, we have Jin Mai and no one on deck after that. So we'll open it up to the group after Jin Mai if anyone wants to share. So Jin Mai, you're on the mic. My heart is racing so fast right now. <laughs> I haven't read in, in so long. And this I, this I wrote uh, a really long time ago. So I just wanted to support and be involved. You got this. <laughs> so I love this so much. This is like uh yeah amazing workshop and so um okay it's called hope never dies and it and it speaks um about uh the inherited um hardships that we go through that dovetail into the wars that our families escaped um but also the way that um they give us perspective on how privileged we are um so it's called Hope Never Dies. No one knows how much I owe, reaping what I've sown from lifetimes ago. As I note this ode, my soul implodes because I know we're much too old, too wise to fold and hide from what life holds at our side. Let's ride. Funny money, when in hungry, drums of honey, funds that numb me, there's been enough for us, then tough for us, rough, unjust, unbearable, never preparable, where are the parables? But these times do find their rhymes relining my spine, inspire me to define what is mine, my life, my love, my strife, and all the beauty that's ever came up. It's all the same love. We girls and boys share the same joys, bear and tame noise, dare to claim the voices which we call our very own. Tones barely grown, there's so much there to know. We are human, new men and women, driven, then dropped, living, then lost, but still striving to thrive, to keep hope alive, because hope never dies, loving 75. When the stillness of night instilled in us fright, veiled us from light, could have killed us, we fight for our lives, for their lives, family, am and cheek. Five and five was 10, but then again, one never made it in. Elbow to elbow, chin to chin, set on the vision to be free once again. Sea to sea, gust of wind, and yet they never gave in. And now I, <laughs> sorry. And now I stride beside my dear bone white. 35 years gone by, and that time resides in her vibrant eyes, still alive for that fire for all she had desired and more to arrive a new life, a mother, a wife, and with stars and stripes adorn her baby's babies being born on Western shores to live like those before. Movements and circles, trueness and purples and pinks with every setting sun summons one to become aware that the cycle of this life and the next, and the next is never done because we're all spun from one thread woven 
from the beginning of time, even ever before it begun. Thanks. <laughs> That was beautiful, Jinmai. And yes, agreeing with the folks in the chat, really powerful. Drums that honey, funds that nummy. Your beginning cadence was just so striking. And I thank you so much for sharing that poem with us about your, your experience with your family. I'm so excited that you got to share. <laughs> all right, folks, give all your love to Jinmai in the chat, in your reactions for sharing such a vulnerable and powerful poem with all of us. And I, as I look on the sign up sheet, we have no one else on deck. So I want to open up to the group if anyone would like to share their poem or if any. Yeah, so I'll open up to new poets first if anyone would like to share their poem that hasn't had the chance already. And then if no one would like to go, I'm going to offer it up to the poets who have performed if they would like to share a second poem. So just feel free to unmute or put it in the chat if you would like to perform a poem with us today or share a poem with us today. Okay, I see, cool. I see that there may not be any new poets gracing the mic today. So I wanna open it up to the poets that did share. Um, so to the poets that did share today, would you all like to share another poem or story with the with us for Lunar New Year? Oh, Estella, yes, we'd love to hear from you. And then Jin Mai, you could go after. Thank you both. Um, yeah, so I can do another one. Um, this one is actually from the writing challenge I'm doing right now, and I wrote this yesterday. So it's a little not perfect, but it's still good. It's called My Wish to the Ox on Lunar New Year to TXT song Blue Hour. As I watched the clock turn to 5.53, I took a deep breath. I sit back and look at my reflection. How can one find these eyes disgraceful? I pull back from writing about my identity, reduce my Asian pride, but today is Lunar New Year. I grapple onto my pen and jot down my thoughts like a song, like this song, Blue Hour, reminding myself that my tan skin and monolid eyes are a small detail of my painting. Mixed with pastel and black monochrome clothing and bursting omnivert energy that comes like a slow burn. But like a song, like this song, Blue Hour, it boosts me up as I twirl through the stars, guiding me to a place where my dream is finally welcomed. Writing and reciting my story while being proud of how far my ancestors have come. Happy disco sound quilted with my mom's haragana, my attempt of hangal, and memories of my bio father's Mandarin. I'll dance all night to this song, to this song, Blue Hour to honor our family and myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isela, for sharing another beautiful poem. Twelve to the stars, guiding me to a place where I am finally welcome. I love that imagery and I, I love the feeling of that sentiment. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna pass the mic to Jin Mai to share a second piece with us. And also again, if you all wanna share after Jin Mai, just let us know in the chat and we would love to bring you on the mic, even if just to share your story or a piece from your workshop, if you attended the morning workshop as well. Real quick for Jin Mai, if you could speak louder when you read your poetry, it would be really good. No, every time I know I might, my voice like <laughs> just, uh, I'm wondering if I can change audio. Okay. You're, you're good right now when you speak, but when you start reading poetry, you go a little more muted. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like I really don't want you to hear. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, this, this one, you know, it's funny because earlier we were talking about how 
why are these poems so sad? I ask the same thing about my work all the time, whatever form it takes on. Um, Hien and I, my husband and I have been um, working with a lot of refugees uh, during the crisis and um, helping comfort and in whatever ways we can um, to comfort those who have been detained um, and those who are facing deportation. And it's, um, it's interesting because it's just been an ongoing fight that's just been brought to life. I mean, it's been going on since we arrived. Um, so thankful for that, um, that more people are aware. So um, in these hardships, what we find is for us and for a lot of other people is our, our faith just strengthens so much more, right? And when we talk about faith and hope, it's about the things that we have. It's like the hope we the hope is in things that we cannot see, but we believe, right? The hope for change, the hope for <laughs> the betterment of humanity, the hope for people to love each other more. Um, and the same could be said about faith. I, I feel like they grow from the same vine. So um, faith in things that we can't see, um, but we know to be true. Um, and a lot of this springs from uh, the hardships that we endure. Sometimes there's, it's just so much that we have to believe in better, <laughs> right? <laughs> or else we would just give up. Um, so uh, love to all those who are still standing. We are the, we are the lucky ones. So this one is called, um, This is All We Need Know. Uh, and it's a poem for my husband. <laughs> a love poem. So yeah, a love poem actually. <laughs> um, you and me leap over cracks and creeks on the street as we meet eye to eye, cheek to cheek to face each feet. Keep composure as we wrap our bootstraps, weep over mishaps, our weakening feet, the ground rattling beneath. Let's not speak. Scattering feet, chattering teeth, sweeping shattered dreams that are just out of reach and keeping each piece because we believe that someday we'll restore it all piece by piece. We'll teach each other that time heals grief and the burdens we've carried will bury as seeds Then upon blossoms and berries will finally feed. Kerchiefs like tattered sheets billow as our grief seeps deep, sleeves and pillows seep tears as we wander and weave while willows weep. We'll learn these lessons only life can teach, defeating these thieves whose hoofbeats deceit. Pull my arrow and bow hoping he don't show, my ego thrown down to my feet. But we know he's bold and ready to show as he rises full force from those cold places below, toe to toe, blow by blow, torso sore, but we can withstand more, as much as we need to endure, to learn these lessons worth so much more. And as the cock crows, I'll weigh down my woes, for they'll weigh me down and keep me slow, and although our weary shoulders run cold, we'll throw our blows boldly like nobody's known. And though we feel like we're fighting alone, the crows and sparrows follow, hovering low. And one day, I know, we'll outgrow this fight, take flight to new heights we never thought we might, shake shadows, break battles, though our wrists rattle. We'll defend our end with sling and stone, sing songs of victory in unwavering tone, even with gashes and lashes and broken bones, because God is our defender, and this is all we need now. Thank you, wow. Jinma. I love having you here on the mic with us. I love everyone that's shared. Jinma, you have so many bars in that poem. I could not keep track of all of them. And the one sentence that really resonated with me is one day I know we'll outgrow this fight. Yeah. And that is a huge hope that I truly believe. And I truly believe for all of us that we won't have to struggle forever. So thank you again for sharing your poem with all of us. Um, thank you, Estella. Thank you, Renee, for sharing your poem with the group. We have another poet that would like to share with us. So Jami would like to share a Vietnamese poem with everyone. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so I, like I've mentioned before, I'm not a poet. <laughs> <laughs> a poet for today. <laughs> yes, but what I can do, however, is share uh, poems by a Vietnamese poets. So I, I'll tell you a little bit of history about her. Her name is Ho Sung Hung. So she was a Vietnamese poet born at the end of the Lei Dynasty. 
she grew up in an era of political and social turmoil. So during that time, um, there was civil war and rebellion. And so for her to write poetry, she has to be very careful, especially against the emperors and, and um, whatnot, and not to get in trouble. And so she tends to use food as an example. But within that poem, there's all these poignant things, you know, pointing out the wrongs of society. And um, especially for women, it was quite um, revolutionary for her to first be a poet. And, you know, she shouldn't even be able to learn how to read or write. And now she's like criticizing the environment. So here are two. They're very short. And I think they probably follow the six, eight look back. Um, so here we go. Thân em như quả mít trên cây Da nó xù xì, mũi nó dày Quân tử có yêu xin đọc cọc, đóng cọc Đừng môn mó, đừng mân mó, nửa nhựa ra tay So what she's saying is my body is like the um, jackfruit in a tree. So as you know, jackfruits are very spiky and they have like this thick skin. Ya no su si, mui na ye, meaning the skin is like, you know, like all spiky and the, the fruit inside is thick. So, you know, there's like, she, her poems are like triple entendre. So there's a sexual content, there's a fruit description, and then there's the critic, you know, in her. Next one is quân tử có yêu xin đóng cọc. So um, a gentleman, if you love, please, um, you know, like put up a like a stick to hold it up, meaning take care of it, treat it with kindness. And also to say, if you are a gentleman, that's what you would do, right? Đừng mân mó nửa nhựa ra tay, meaning don't touch and squeeze or the little sap will come out and, and, and ooze on your hands. So you can see that like the three, so if you touch and squeeze in a sexual term, right? Something <laughs> comes out, right? And then in the critical term is, is be careful, you're going to hurt the fruit, you know, or be careful, I will hurt you if you are not careful. And I saw these, these really like entendres. So I think I'll just do that one poem today. I think it's just perfect to describe women and how strong we are inside and, and to be careful, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Demi. Yes, I love her poetry and just like how radical it was at the time to just be so bold and fearless and independent and using, I love it when poets use food and fruit to kind of like capture these different messages as well in these innuendos. So thank you so much for that, Demi. I want to pass the mic just to um, offer it to um, Jujin. Jujin, do you have a poem that you would like to share with us to close out the open mic for today? Oh, Jujin, unmute. Yes, he, he needs to unmute. Do a uh, bum unmute. <laughs> so okay. there, yes. Yes, okay. one way, yes. I have a lot of one, but uh, I just try is it the morning, but I, I, I put somewhere, I don't know. So uh, I'm going to take it out so you can talk it and I look at it and I talk to you. We sure, we sure put them on the spot, right? Um, I know. <laughs> should I share the second one? Because it's quite juicy. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Me. All right, here we go. So. Thân em thời trắng phần em tròn bày nổi ba chìm mấy nước non rắn nát mặt dầu tay kẻ nặng nhưng em vẫn giữ tấm lòng son so this is about a vietnamese dessert that's made out of the rice um, and it's these little rice balls that float in a sugary um, ginger, <coughs> ginger so she's describing the the, the fruit saying oh, my body is white and round um, and my uh, my fate is round, right? So describing that uh, dessert, bay nổi ba chìm mấy nước non, meaning I float in water. So meaning for a woman's um, uh, life, it, she just kind of floats from place to place. She doesn't have the right to have guidance or to control her own life. So she just fall, flows with the water or flows, you know, in this sugary um, juice. Rang na mặc dầu tay kẻ nặng. Oh, okay. So the person who molded this this ball of rice 
um, has to squeeze her and you know it's it's so when you think about the, the terms that's being used is being molded and, and squeezed so another cr- you know criticism about women's roles nhưng em vẫn giữ tấm lòng son but my soul my heart still keeps this <coughs> innocence so it's um, inside <coughs> this little rice cake is this wonderful uh, dessert sweet taste inside that's made of mung bean So inside you're still sweet and innocent, but you know life squeezes you. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jemmy. Okay, Dujin, are you ready to share your final poem with us today? You can unmute. The first I thank you, Jemmy uh, Kron. And uh, anybody uh, who can uh, explore the Vietnamese language and uh, the poetry in Vietnam to everybody listen to it. Uh, very thank you. And Jitro, and I invite Jitro who wanted to learn about uh, the law of uh, poetry. And uh, our group can uh, guide you, can write down the one of poetry. And, Now, you know, I, I can read the, my poetry. I just uh, write it in the morning, but very sad because you know why? Uh, I am an old man. So almost I think about the country when I come in here. So something I'm very, very emotional. So talking about the Jitter day is a new day, new year. So I can read it for you here and to understand what I feel in, in a jit day for our country. I read it now. Nghe tiếng pháo xuân về chưa nhỉ? Mộng tàn hoang tóc trắng quê người. Nồng ngơ ngẩn quay nhìn bàn tổ. Lệ tràn đời chén rượu buồn rơi Tay bỗng trắng Tuổi hồng tóc bạc Xuân đi qua sắc pháo hững hờ Tơ trùng phím Nhạc lòng vội tắt Chợt bước chân Nững thững bơ vơ đó là chú mới viết hồi sáng này. <cười> oh, I'm Thank so you. Beautiful. May I make uh, a quick translation as best as I could? Yes. Um, so he is saying in this moment because it's New Year's, I hear the firecrackers. Yet here I am, a white-haired man in a stranger's country. Looking back at my own country, I hold up a cup to toast and flower petals are falling. Sorry, so sad. Anyways, mm. yeah, poetry's alive, and here I am alone in my steps. Thank you, Chu. Cảm ơn Chu. Cảm ơn Chu đã chia sẻ với chúng con. Thank you, Chu, so much for sharing your poem for us. Thank you, Jamie, for translating that poem and all the emotions that came with it. And thank you, everyone, so much for tuning in to our Lunar New Year open mic today. Um, we are gonna we're closing out the open mic session for today and so shout out to all of you who learned to write Vietnamese poetry today in the look back style and Gai Yao. Thank you for being here to share our poems, especially shout out to Acela, Renee, and Jin Mai, Jami, and Du Jin for sharing as well. And for all the participants in the workshop who shared. And with that, um, look forward to the rest of the events today because we have a ton of fun stuff planned. So I'll give her love. I'm giving all my love to you all and I'll pass it back to Ratika. Thank you, An. Thank you. Hi, folks. Um, I want to thank you all again. Thank you, uh, An, for leading and for leading the open mic for us. And I want to thank everyone who participated in sharing their stories. I know um, it was really emotional and powerful, and it's really difficult to share personal stories and feelings out to a crowd. And I think uh, 
and you did a great job of creating this wonderful safe environment for us to appreciate everyone's art um, and also be able to learn something new from each and every person here. Um, thank you for uh, doing that open mic. And I wanna uh, ask Ali to join me virtually uh, on screen. You can see our matching backgrounds lining up with each other. Um, Ali is one of our newest gallery teachers, um, but she's no, she's not new to hosting online. She's been there with me on Facebook First Fridays and our teacher events. Um, so I'm really glad to bring Ali on for this portion for co-hosting with me for our next couple of acts. Hi, Ali. Hi, Rothika. Thank you so much for inviting me to co-host this part with you. And thank you so much again to Trami and Anne and Chu Chin and to all the people who opened up and shared and presented and shared this vulnerable, beautiful work, uh, Trin Mai and Renee um, and Asela. It was just stunning to be hearing these really beautiful works. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you, Anne, for teaching us so much about poetry. It's been just a delight to be a part of this event with you all. And I'm certainly excited for what's coming up next with cooking demonstrations and dance. And we have a lot coming up in store for the rest of the day. So there's certainly a lot going on and I'm just thrilled to be here. Next up, we have Shannon, one of our senior uh, studio art educators who will be doing a really delightful art activity with us to make our own little ox for the year of the ox. And so with that, Shannon. Hi guys. Uh, we're going to be making some super cute little oxes out of um, toilet paper rolls or maybe even cardboard rolls. So what I'm going to ask you guys all to do is we're going to go gather some supplies. We're going to need some cardboard rolls, some extra cardboard just for fun, some paint, a Sharpie and some paintbrushes. Now remember, art is all about problem solving. So if you don't have one of these supplies, there are lots of other things that we can use for this project. You can cut up an old car um, cardboard box for some cereal. You can find some really stiff paper. There are all sorts of really cool supplies that you can use for this project. Now I'm going to switch my camera so that you guys can see all the cool toys I have in front of me. All right. So for this project, we're going to start with our paper towel roll, but actually I think I'm going to give you guys a few moments to go gather some of these supplies. I'm going to give you maybe two minutes. Now, while you go do that, I would like to tell you some fun facts that I learned about the ox this week. Um, did you guys know that oxen can swim? And in fact, they are so cool in that they, when we take care of them, we have to put shoes on them. And they actually wear two shoes per foot because their feet are shaped so funny. That means a regular ox has eight shoes on them at any given time. Can you believe that? Eight shoes? All right. Well, I think it's time to get started. So I pre-painted my paper towel roll, but I think I want to add some spots to my ox today. Now, this year is supposed to be the year of the metal ox. So you could use some cool metallic paint or a metallic Sharpie to get some cool effects, but I'm gonna go ahead and add some spots to make my guy super, super exciting. Now, can I get you guys in the chat to describe some of the coolest features of Oxen that we might wanna think about including in our project? Do we want to have spots? Do we want to have really long horns? Ooh, I see the horns. Anything else? Their fur? I know we can probably draw it, but the sound that oxen make is probably something I wish to include. Um, they're mooing. Uh, I think that'd be so fun to be able to include in this little project. <laughs> I think we could all give a voice to our little oxen. 
as we play with them later. Now, once your guy is all painted, you're gonna take your cardboard and you're gonna cut it in half. Oh, I'm gonna cut my other one. That one's too strong of cardboard. And the reason I'm gonna cut it in half is because I don't want my oxen to be too tall. Now, if you didn't have a paper towel roll, it's perfectly okay to take some thick paper and roll it into a circle. I think we have some awesome examples just like that. Now, what else do we need? We need some horns. So I pre-painted some horns right here, but there's a whole bunch of different horn shapes we could make. We could make some that turn down. And I'm gonna make some right now that are kind of uh, upside down C. Do you guys see how that kind of makes a C shape? What are some other shapes that we could use to make some cool horns? Could these ones over here, I use kind of a half of an S shape. I find that very fun. I'm gonna add some details too, like some pointy tips. And just like all of the other parts of our face, we're gonna have to cut these out. All right, now we got to figure out a way to attach these to our guy. Now I have a cool supply called glue dots because that's going to let me go super fast, but glue sticks also work really great for this project. I'm just going to stick my little dot of glue on the back of my horns and stick them on. Oh no, my cat is coming along because she wants to help play. And I think we need some eyes for this cow. So I'm going to use my Sharpie to draw some really cute little eyes going right over my cute spot that I made earlier. Now, what we also need is a great big nose for our ox, right? Yeah? All right, so I'm gonna take a piece of pink paper because I want my cow to have a pink nose and I'm going to just cut a little square and then round off the edges so that it's a nice round shape because there's no pointy corners on my cow, right? Besides maybe the horns. Now, I think I need some nostrils for this cow. So I'm just going to add little L shapes, and then maybe a backwards L shape to create those nostrils and add a little mouth across the bottom. And then again, I'm gonna use a fancy glue dot to attach this guy. Right there to the bottom of my cow. Now, I made this guy super, super short, but I think it needs some legs. So I'm going to take some more of that cardboard and I'm going to cut it into some strips to make my legs. Now, I don't want these too long, so I'm going to have them be kind of short. And I'm gonna just use some easy to find tape and I'm gonna tape those to the inside of my cow so he can stand. All right, are there any other details I need to add to my cow? Does he need anything else? 
Maybe a tail. How could we add a tail? Could we do that with cardboard? Or do you think we could just draw it on right, right on the back of our little cow? There we go, there's a cow, uh, our lovely ox. All right, did you guys make an ox? I hope you did. Now, I have one last fun fact for you. Did you know that when oxen are feeling threatened, they do the super cute thing where they make a circle with their bodies, with their horns facing out so that they can protect their cute little babies on the inside of that circle? I thought that was so cute and I just had to share it. All right. I'm going to turn off this lower camera so that I can see you because I hope that you guys can show off some of your super cool <laughs> oxen. I see that Rothika made a cool one and Allie made a cool one. It looks like hers is super tall. Did anyone else make any? Cool oxen. Oh, well, I can't wait to see them. I hope you share them with us online with the hashtag Lunar New Year and SJMA see what you think. All right, and with that, I think I'm going to hand things back over to Miss Radhika because I believe she has a super cool, super neat show for us. Um, hi folks, it's me again. I just want to point out my ox is here. He's got little feet. He has no tail, but I'll, I'll add a tail on too um, in just a moment. But what I want to do is move right into our uh, Rising Phoenix performance. Uh, hopefully you've been to the museum before and seen them in person. Um, this performance is very similar to that, except you'll be an exclusive front row seating now because it's basically a private show for all of us. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that video. Um, and so sit back and enjoy this wonderful dance that they filmed right in front of the museum for us to kind of get us back into that same setting that we enjoy um, every Lunar New Year at the San Jose Museum of Art. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, let's give it up for Rising Phoenix. Uh, first of all, put it in the chat, put it in your reactions. I want to see everyone. Uh, yeah, give us uh, that for that wonderful video performance that they recorded. Hopefully you caught the glimpses of the museum in the background. Imagine you were there. Um, what do you think, Allie? Oh, that was just incredible. Thank you so much, Rising Phoenix, for that really beautiful and stunning performance. It was just amazing to watch the dragons. And I was really just mesmerized by the eyelids and all the movement <laughs> of the dragon masks and the dynamic energy with the jumping and then jumping off platforms. It was just all around a really incredible performance. Uh, so I'll be honest, so the platform jumping always makes me a little bit nervous, but they're experts, so I can we can always trust them uh, to execute it nicely. But yeah, that was so fun, and I was so glad that they were able to film in front of the museum for us to kind of bring it back uh, and bring some normalcy back to this virtual event. Um, Definitely, yeah. What we're going to do is I'm going to, uh, with Ali, introduce our next segment. Um, it's going to be our Chinatown chat um, featuring... Uh, Dick Evans and Kathy Chin Leong. Um, so this is going to be uh, a talk about San Francisco's Chinatown, but I want to bring up some in interesting facts that the museum and kind of that whole South Market Street area, the C Cesar Chavez Plaza, was the original site of the original Chinatown in San Jose. And you can actually find a plaque uh, on the Fairmont Hotel right next to the museum uh, documenting that this was like an original site. It unfortunately had burned down um, and other infrastructure was put up there. Uh, but it's a cool connection that we have uh, to, the, to the history of the city. Um, so we have photographer Dick Evans uh, and journalist Kathy Chin Leong uh, ready to share stories and images from their book Chinatown and it has beautiful images um, that highlights uh, San Francisco's historic neighborhood and the people that make it up and its rich history. Um, I will drop some links too to where you can find the book and purchase it um, and all proceeds go to their nonprofit publisher and the Chinese Culture Center. Um, and one thing I want to encourage uh, is you folks to come up with some questions about the people that they're sharing these stories about, about their process, uh, utilize the chat and um, or raise your hand and we can make sure your questions get answered uh, towards the end uh, of their presentation. Um, so keep that in mind. I'm gonna play a short trailer really quickly uh, just so we can get a better understanding. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Dick and Kathy. All right, so let me share my screen once more. And here we go. Alrighty, Dick and Kathy, take it away. The floor is all yours. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. 
Raise yeah. your hand if you can. Great, terrific. Um, so first of all, that uh, lion dance on the uh, platform and stools made me nervous too. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know how many people know those lion heads are not light. They weigh like 10, 12 pounds. And they have to maneuver those as well as doing all the uh, jumping and dancing. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, uh, Radhika. And thank you, Ali, for inviting us to be part of your community day and feature on Lunar New Year. Um, and we are looking forward to sharing some of the images and some of the stories behind the San Francisco Chinatown book. Uh, so let me just start with a little bit of history on San Francisco's Chinatown. Uh, and here is, uh, and I know a number of you are from the Bay Area, so you may have visited there. Uh, this is the main street in San Francisco's Chinatown. It's Grant Avenue. It's one of the oldest streets in San Francisco. And you can see a very iconic uh, scene here with the red lanterns uh, and the architecture. Um, so this is what most of us think of when we think of San Francisco's Chinatown. Uh, and I had always assumed when I first visited it in the uh, 1970s and 80s uh, that it was, in fact, uh, had grown up this way. Uh, I knew it started in the mid 1800s. And I assumed that just the uh, Chinese immigrants had brought their architecture and, and their style. And that's how it grew up. As I'll mention in a minute, that's not uh, what happened, actually. And uh, but yet it's what we think of now when we think of Chinatown. So it's not a surprise that we used a street scene from uh, Grant Avenue, as you see here, for the cover of the book. So this is a facade of one of the buildings on Grant Avenue. Uh, and it's known uh, for its uh, sort of quintessential Chinese or quote oriental architecture. Uh, and you see, I think one more uh, example here, you see the pagoda rooftops uh, and the uh, historic uh, street lamps that you see here. Uh, so, as I mentioned, that's not the way Chinatown always was. And in fact, when it was founded in the mid 1800s, uh, it was essentially a shanty town or a ghetto, you might say. Uh, the Chinese immigrants were forced to live in a very confined area, about 24 square blocks, three by eight uh, blocks. Uh, it was low rise, uh, unsanitary housing, and not at all considered a desirable part of the city in which to live. Uh, so what changed and how did, uh, did, did Chinatown get this new, much more attractive uh, facade to it? Uh, well, all of you, uh, I'm sure, are familiar with the significance of the year 1906 and the major earthquake that hit San Francisco, basically destroyed most of the downtown. Uh, and what wasn't destroyed then was destroyed in subsequent fires, uh, or much of it was. And that included Chinatown. Uh, so at that time, the, uh, the city leaders uh, thought this was an opportunity to maybe relocate and move the Chinese immigrants out to the outskirts of the city. Uh, so that was the plan, but the residents resisted. They had been in this location for over 50 years. Uh, to them, it was home. And even though it had been destroyed and burned, that's where they wanted to stay. Uh, so they were successful in renegotiate, or negotiating with the city leaders to rebuild Chinatown and to rebuild it as both a tourist attraction and as a residential community. And it's a tourist attraction aspect uh, that created the architecture, this very attractive, interesting, uh, historic Chinese architecture that now um, is particularly prevalent along Grant Avenue. Uh, now, the immigrants uh, to San Francisco's Chinatown were first brought by the gold rush uh, starting in 1849, and then the railroad construction after that. So thousands of Chinese immigrants uh, poured into San Francisco. Uh, and after the earthquake, that continued. Uh, and even after the earthquake, uh, there was still a lot of discrimination against the Chinese immigrants. 
as far back as 1882, there was a law passed called the Chinese Exclusion Act, which explicitly ex uh, made it difficult for Chinese to immigrate uh, to the United States, a very overt uh, law. But that continued uh, with, with other informal and subtle forms of discrimination and difficulty in immigrating uh, up through the 1950s. Uh, and in the uh, period between the earthquake and the 1950s, while Chinatown was being rebuilt and still growing, uh, those who came came through Angel Island, uh, which was in a way similar, uh, although different from Ellis Island in New York. But Angel Island was where the immigrants for the Pacific came. Uh, and the Chinese immigrants were separated and, and put in detention centers. Uh, and it was much uh, more difficult process for them uh, to obtain entry than it was for other uh, immigrants generally. Uh, during that time, while they were in the detention facilities, many of them carved their names or their initials or uh, poems or, or short stories into the wood uh, walls and rails of the detention centers. Uh, and these have all been captured and actually put in a book and translated. Uh, but they tell a very interesting story. And I think this one is especially poignant, uh, if you can read it, uh, in that they treated the Chinese immigrants like a number. And this young man mentions his number is 80340. They would not address them by name. They would only post their number uh, if they had to go to a health check or to, uh, interrogation. And then on the day that they were uh, processed to go uh, come into the US, they would just put your number on the blackboard and it says San Francisco. And you can probably note at the bottom, you see that this was carved uh, in the wood by an 11 year old uh, boy. So it's a pretty chilling reminder of some of the things that we've seen recur recently we occur with, with some of the uh, immigration restrictions and the separation of families and the wall on the Mexican border. Uh, so the first hundred years of, of Chinatown and immigration was uh, fraught with, uh, with a lot of discrimination and prejudice against the incoming immigrants. Uh, and that I think has informed Chinatown to be a very socially aware, social and justice aware community. Uh, and today there are two monuments that uh, are a tribute to much more recent uh, cases of social hey, injustice. You? Oh, glad we have a young attendee there. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Uh, so these are two statues that are in Chinatown today over the last several decades. The first one is the goddess of democracy that you saw in the prior slide. And you may actually recognize that uh, if you saw uh, news coverage of the Tiananmen Square uprising in 1989. Uh, but that was originally a 50 foot statue in Tiananmen Square. It was replicated in bronze and it sits today right in the center of Chinatown in Portsmouth Square. The other one is a statue a bit more recent in the last couple decades called the Comfort Women. And it's a tribute to the Chinese, Filipino and Korean young women and girls who were taken by the Japanese army and government to be sex slaves uh, during World War II. Uh, so this statue is in St. Mary's Square right in Chinatown. It actually created uh, quite a, a split, unfortunately, between San Francisco and its traditional city city, Osaka in Japan. Uh, hopefully that gets mended together in the future. So as we like to say, uh, we feel that the story of Chinatown is a story of resilience, survival, uh, but also celebration. Uh, let me turn it over to Kathy, who did uh, over 100 interviews uh, in writing the stories behind the images in this book. Kathy. Happy New Year, everyone. Gung hei fat choi, as they say in Cantonese. I wanted to show you this one of my favorite murals. This is James Leong's mural called 100 Years of Chinese in America. And it was created in 1952. As you look from the left and move your eyes all the way to the right, it begins with hardship in China. And then it ends with 
assimilation in America. You can see this seven panel mural on permanent display at the Chinese Historical Society of America Museum. And that um, is in Chinatown. Uh, of course, you're celebrating the Lunar New Year. So you've, you have other parts of the program that have a lot of information on that. But of course, it's the biggest social event, the biggest cultural event of the year. Uh, normally this year, unfortunately, of course, it will not be in person. It will be virtual for the first time in uh, decades, if not a century or more. Uh, but here are a few shots of it. You see a lion dancer here, very much like the one that you just saw if you watched the prior uh, program. And behind it, you see also a dragon. Uh, so dragons and lions are, of course, very popular in the parade. The parade itself is over a mile long. Uh, it annually, in normal years, attracts hundreds of thousands uh, for the full uh, two-week celebration of Chinese New Year, culminating in the parade, and uh, you know, well over 100,000 in attendance at the parade as well. Uh, the parade is attended by uh, uh, many different groups, including a, a lot of student groups. And here you see a couple of young men uh, who are elementary school students, actually uh, 13 or 14 years old, who are stilt walkers here in Monkey King costumes. Uh, and they traverse that whole mile and a quarter or so parade route on stilts that are six feet or more uh, above the ground. I think the next one we have, uh, yeah, a picture of this year's symbol of the Zodiac, which is, of course, the ox, as you've heard by now. Uh, this is a, a sculpture, statue of an oxen. Uh, this one happens to be in Portsmouth Square. And this year, the city of San Francisco, uh, because there was no parade, uh, put up 11 oxen statues around the city and are encouraging people to go around the city and, and find each of these. Uh, as you can see, they're painted very colorfully. Each one is unique. Uh, there are several different designs and the painting is uh, unique to that particular oxen. Uh, now the ox, if you have not heard, is known to be hardworking, persistent, and uh, also honest. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, 2021 lives up to the spirit of the ox. Uh, now the uh, Lunar New Year is not the only festival. Of course, there are numerous festivals throughout the year. Another big one is the Lunar uh, 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 Moon Festival, it takes place in the fall. Uh, this happens to be the moon goddess and her uh, moon god dressed up in costume. It's, in reality, it's Maggie Wong, who is a TV broadcaster and journalist who uh, grew up in Chinatown and participates each year for the last uh, 20 years or so as the moon goddess. But there are other festivals as well. So hopefully by 2021 fall, uh, the, the uh, Moon Festival will be able to be held in person. And it's a great one to attend. Now today, if Bruce Lee were alive, the Kung Fu action hero would be 80 years old. And before he came on the scene, Chinese males had no role models in the media. They would be cast in bit parts as houseboys or evil emperors. But Drew, Bruce Lee, the muscly action hero, changed all that. He changed the life of Jeff Chin, pictured on the left. When Jeff was a boy, he was picked on because he was Chinese. And one day after a difficult uh, time at school, at nighttime, when he's about to go to bed, he feels like the um, action hero, Bruce Lee picture on the wall, reached out to him and told him everything would be okay. Well, since then, he's become one of the top collectors of Bruce Lee memorabilia in the entire world. And we will get to see his collection at the Chinese Historical Society of American Museum this fall when they host a Life of Bruce Lee exhibition. Now, Tai Chi is also um, another Chinese tradition, a very good form of exercise. Here we are at the Worldwide International Tai Chi Day, which uh, we gather a group of volunteers for this photo shoot. 
We also found a Tai Chi master. This is Sifu Xu Fen Zhao, and she was willing to demonstrate some Tai Chi moves in front of murals and other landmarks on the street of Chinatown. Now we are here with the Tong family at Chinatown's Far East Cafe. And at this baby party for one month old, you have to have dyed red eggs to represent fertility and a plate of ginger, which represents energy and strength. I think it's the kids that love Chinese New Year the most. You typically give two red envelopes. Each one is filled with two fresh bills and that represents double happiness. Meanwhile, the wedding tea ceremony is a treasured tradition, but fewer and fewer Chinese couples are honoring it. But we were able to find Liana and Michael that were the exception. They will present tea to their elders and in turn, the parents and grandparents, one couple at a time, offer money or, and or jewelry. Now brides aren't the only ones who receive jewelry. Many times an older woman will start handing down her heirlooms as she gets older to her granddaughter, daughter, or daughter-in-law. In ancient times, people believed if you wore a 24 karat gold necklace or jade bracelet, you would be protected from evil spirits. This is one of my favorite murals because it depicts everyday Chinatown life here, a modern woman passes a traditional tailor shop. She's wearing a traditional jade bracelet, probably from her mother or grandmother, and she carries a bag of good luck oranges and a box of bakery treats for a sweet life. Now, this is my family sharing dim sum, otherwise known as going to yum cha. And plates of chicken feet and steamed tripe are not exotic, but everyday dishes. So why don't you type in your favorite dim sum and let us know what you enjoy. San Francisco's Chinatown is about 170 years old uh, and it has survived uh, despite all the pressures around it uh, in this 24 square blocks right in the center of the city. Uh, so you, you can guess that it has a very strong community spirit to have survived that long. Uh, and the best way to maybe feel that spirit is to take a walk through Portsmouth Square, which is uh, the center of Chinatown or sometimes called the living room of Chinatown. And on a normal day, if it's not raining, you'll see women and men out playing cards with various tables set up around Portsmouth Square. Uh, and when I was taking photos this day, uh, it just started to pour and I assumed everyone would fold up and go home with their card game. But that's not what happened. Uh, they pulled out their umbrellas, they kept their hands and uh, moved under the protection of the gate that leads to the Kearney Street Bridge. And as you can see, the card game continued. Uh, it never stops, I understand. It goes on, on and on. It's gone on for decades uh, in Portsmouth Square. So it's, it's quite a tradition. Uh, another uh, uh, community tradition are the family associations or benevolent associations of which there are, are uh, numerous ones within uh, Chinatown. This happens to be one where we were permitted to go inside on a, week, a weekend uh, morning uh, just to see how people use them and enjoy them. And here you can see a group of men uh, playing a game, uh, Mahjong or checker, Chinese checkers. And uh, then, uh, you will also see people reading Chinese newspapers, but people will come from uh, the South Bay, uh, where many of you are probably from, the East Bay, uh, and come in just to join and see family and friends and participate on weekends. Another uh, Chinatown tradition is Miss Chinatown USA. Uh, and you might ask, why is there a separate Miss Chinatown? Why don't they just compete in? Uh, Miss America or Miss California pageant. Well, the, the uh, ugly fact is that for decades, uh, the young Chinese women were discriminated against and not allowed to participate in those broader uh, pageants uh, and uh, both overtly and covertly discouraged from 
uh, being part of that. So Chinatown formed its own pageant uh, together with other Chinatowns around North America. Uh, so today, even though fortunately that discrimination is, is gone, uh, there's still uh, the pride in holding that annual uh, event. We were able to uh, meet and get to know Miss Chinatown 2019 during the course of the book. This is, uh, is her here. Her name is Catherine Wu. She's from San Francisco, but not uh, Chinatown. Um, but in, order, in uh, addition to being uh, in a uh, uh, well-poised, beautiful, intelligent, uh, and uh, you know, of great character, we learned that she's also an Olympic level archer. Uh, and you can see her here with her very elaborate com uh, competition bow that she's holding. Uh, so we asked her if she would mind uh, visiting a few uh, traditional spots around San Francisco with her bow, uh, which she was happy to do. Uh, in addition to the Miss Chinatown story of discrimination, uh, there are many others in Chinatown. This is just another one. Uh, the Chinese in Chinatown were discouraged from using YMCAs throughout the city. Uh, so uh, the result was they ended up forming their own YMCA, which today is after a number of decades is a very prized uh, uh, organization within the Chinese community. Of course, that, that's no longer true in terms of using other whys, but uh, this one is still a source of pride. There are also uh, playgrounds within uh, Chinatown, again, for the same kind of reasons. And there is a Chinese hospital, uh, which was formed because Chinese were discriminated against in using medical facilities outside of Chinatown. Here you see the donor wall in this beautiful uh, new modern hospital, uh, which is available to uh, Chinese uh, residents and others. It's not limited to Chinese. Uh, Kathy was born there, uh, she told me, and Bruce Lee was born there in the older facilities, not the new uh, facility that we have. Imagine your home is the size of a closet and that closet is shared with four other people. This is single renter occupancy or SRO apartments. You see them all over Chinatown. Here with no access to washers or dryers, you have to hand wash and hang your clothes outside to dry and you share a restroom and kitchen with neighbors. Now on the day of this particular photo shoot, we met a family with a grandmother who is too sick to walk down the stairs to visit the doctor. So again, these places have um, no uh, washers, dryers, or elevators to go down to the bottom. The family wanted this pastor, Reverend Fong, to come and pray for her. So with compassion and tenderness, he took both her hands in his and whispered a prayer in Chinese. Going from old to young, if you're a teenager on the Dragon Boat Racing Team from the Community Youth Center, all your gear and practice time is free of charge. Thanks to CYC, the sport's transforming the lives of at-risk kids. When I was young, it was not cool to be Chinese, but today things are different. This is Yuhan Chen, only six years old. She picks up a brush for the first time at this Chinese New Year event, and she finds out she excels at Chinese calligraphy. Meanwhile, Tyler Pham happily samples Dragon Beard candy, making a beard of his own. Now, Dragon Beard was originally the dessert of ancient Chinese emperors made from a solid block of syrup and hand pulled to form thousands and thousands of strands. It's really delicious. These buildings belong to family associations with more than 200 of them in Chinatown. Back in the 1800s, when you landed in Chinatown, you would look up your association based on your village or your last name, and the association would help you secure a job and a place to stay. These associations often feature shrines, and note that these are private clubhouses, not open to outsiders. You can't just go up as a tourist to see them. So getting in to take these pictures for this book was extremely rare. The largest of the organizations is called the Chinese Consolidated 
Benevolent Association. It consists of more than 50,000 members in the US and Canada. Chinatown is its headquarters. Recently, they worked with local officials to block marijuana shops from coming into Chinatown. This older woman is Cecilia Chang, who recently passed away at 100 years old. She was a very famous restaurateur who was also nicknamed the Julia Child of Chinese cooking. Back in 1968, she opened the very first Chinese elegant restaurant called the Mandarin. It was based in Ghirardelli Square. And years later, her son, Philip, caught the restaurant bug. He's a co-founder of P.F. Chang's with restaurants all over the world. Here, Chinese schools go back as far as the 1800s. These languages schools were erected because parents feared their children would lose language and the culture of the homeland. So the youth learn Cantonese, the language of the Guangdong province, where most Chinese are from. Today, most schools teach Mandarin, the national language of China. This is Corey Chin, Chan, lion head whisperer. For over 40 years, he has been restoring injured lion heads and he gives them back their roar. He is self-taught. He replaces eyelids used for blinking. He glues on new fur. He paints over the scratches until the lion looks like new. And after repairs, says Rory, Corey, and I quote, the new memories come back to the lion. I've been uh, sort of monitoring some of the questions coming in the chat room and we definitely want to get to some of those. So I'm, I'm going to speed up a little bit on this next section on food and restaurants. Um, and there is a lot of information uh, available on that through other sources, but, uh, and also on our website uh, for the book. Uh, but there are local restaurants like you see here uh, that have been around a while, but there are also some new restaurants coming into Chinatown, as you see in the next couple of slides. Uh, one of those is China Live, uh, which you see here. And now you see the kitchen, as you can see, a very modern contemporary kitchen. Uh, it is an excellent restaurant. It's one you should uh, give a try if you do go into uh, Chinatown. Uh, here you see giant steamers uh, cooking the dumplings. And this one I love, the giant chocolate mousse bowl. Uh, another uh, quite modern and, and very nice restaurant is one called Mr. Jews, which has actually uh, received a Michelin star. Here you see a very exquisite servings. It's right on Grant Street, uh, Grant Avenue, excuse me. And you see a number of uh, young restaurateurs like Kathy Fang here, who has won a number of awards uh, for her cooking. Uh, and she, she learned working at her parents' restaurant, House of Nanking, which is still open in Chinatown. This is Mo Li Shinki, a business of dried meats and poultry over 100 years old. Now, as a child, when I stayed at my grandmother's SRO, she made this steamed dried salted fish over rice for breakfast. It was delicious. I encourage you all to go to Eastern Bakery to have its specialty, which is coffee crunch cake. And is only one of two bakeries in the entire city that makes it. Every day at four o'clock, the little grandmas emerge from their apartments for produce on sale on Stockton Street, which is considered the local's Chinatown. The lifeblood of uh, Chinatown's economy are really the small businesses, the family owned businesses and, and restaurateurs uh, and entrepreneurs. Uh, this is one of those entrepreneurs. Uh, this is Tain Chen. She's 83 year, years old now, uh, and she was working six or seven days a week, even during COVID, uh, because she has an online business for her walks. Uh, she claims to be the largest seller of walks between Hong Kong and New York, and I have no reason to doubt her. Uh, but there are many other 
small businesses. This is an herbalist. Uh, so we visited him and his, his, uh, you can see the racks of herbs and uh, medications behind him. Uh, here you see a florist in Ross Alley. Uh, you see a studio photographer, I think in the next one who has taken, has photos on his wall of at least three or four presidents, many movie stars and others who have come to Chinatown that he's photographed. Uh, and here's an acupuncturist. Uh, so these are just a few of the many family owned small businesses that are the lifeblood uh, of Chinatown. Uh, here you have uh, a tea tasting boutique, uh, which caters mostly to uh, tourists and is a wonderful way to spend an hour or so if you do visit uh, Chinatown. There are several of these tea test boutiques uh, and it's really fun to uh, do that. Uh, another type of business that caters to tourism heavily is are the uh, jewelers and the uh, jade carvings and antiquities that you see here. They've been hit especially hard as you can imagine uh, with the pandemic. Uh, but just like the restaurants, uh, in addition to the traditional shops, there are some very new upscale contemporary uh, types of um, shops uh, coming into Chinatown. This one is a gift shop at China Live. And I did see that someone had a question, what was the restaurant with the steaming buns? That's China Live, it's the name. It's on Broadway Street, uh, Broadway right between uh, Stockton and Grant. Uh, but this is a gift shop at China Live, uh, which really has some wonderful things that uh, the woman shown there, Cindy Chen, who's the co-owner and wife of the chef of China Live, George Chen. Uh, she went all around the world and, and curated this collection of quite unique, uh, high quality items uh, in the gift shop. And another upscale boutique in the next shot is Kim plus Ono, uh, which sells especially hand printed silk kimonos and blouses and uh, other clothing. Here you happen to see a picture of uh, from the Moon Festival. Uh, the shop was holding a Crazy Rich Asians lookalike contest. So this was one of the uh, young women who dressed up and was there shop. Uh, so uh, with that, I think we'd like to close with this image, uh, which is in another nice restaurant, uh, a new restaurant called Dim Sum Corner. It's right on the corner of Grant Avenue and California Streets. Uh, it's open for takeout now, I know, because I just uh, did a takeout a week ago. Uh, but this is a mural painted in a back hall in that new restaurant. And we loved it because we think it really combines a very modernistic uh, feel to it, uh, like the graphic arts design of it, the modern uh, you know, young woman with the camera with a very traditional uh, red dress. So like Chinatown, uh, it's very traditional, but it's also forward looking and modern. Uh, so it is the back cover of the book actually. And I think uh, the next slide maybe has the book website. Yeah. And I know some people were asking uh, about the book website. It's quite an extensive website. It has more photos than are in the book itself. It also has more stories from Kathy's interviews and a more extensive history of San Francisco's Chinatown, as well as information about how to order the book and, and their upcoming events. Uh, about the book. So with that, uh, we've at least got a couple minutes, I think, left, Rodica, and uh, I would be delighted to answer any questions. And I think maybe you've been, you or all have been watching that if you have any questions for us. Um, yes, uh, we've had some questions uh, saved up. Ali, do you want to read the first one out for us? Sure, yeah. Thank you both so much for your presentation. It was really beautiful to see a lot of these photographs and thank you for telling us some of these stories as you're going through. So one question that we had, someone asked, um, what are some of your personal spots you'd recommend for first time San Francisco Chinatown visitors to check out? Um, I would say start with the Chinatown Visitor Center on Kearney. 
they will give you a map and you can watch a little video um, to see what some of the stores are. And the people manning the, um, the desk there can give you some pointers. And um, I think one of the great restaurants is China Live because of the fact that the menus are in English, the boutique is stunning, and uh, you will really enjoy the food there. Um, I think that those are a couple of tips for me. Uh, the other comment I would make is, as I mentioned, it's only 24 square blocks. So this is not a big physical area. area. And uh, most of the, uh, certainly the tourist facing shops are on Grant Avenue. Uh, so it's pretty easy to walk from one end of Grant Avenue to the other. And if you start on the Bush Street side, you'll end up actually right at China Live, so, uh, which is on Broadway, which is the other border. Uh, so there you have the walk shop, you have the kite shop, you have multiple restaurants, dim sum corner, you've got uh, antiquity shops, you've got jewelry shops, you've got tea tasting. Uh, so you can really uh, uh, do everything along Grant Avenue. And then you can have lunch at China Live and then uh, don't forget to go on Stockton Street though too, because Stockton Street is a people's Chinatown and it's, uh, there are a lot of food markets. Uh, they have really excellent fresh produce and variety that you don't find outside of Chinatown in terms of fruits and things that are carried. And uh, uh, I know a number of people who go there just to shop for their fruits and vegetables. Uh, you know, non-Chinese, <laughs> just because they have such good selection and such a variety and good quality. Yes, I encourage you to go to Stockton Street and um, buy something new. Like, you know, you'll see some unusual fruits and vegetables that you've never tried. So just buy one and try it and take it home and see what you think. And also go to the Chinese Historical uh, Society Association Museum. And that is in Chinatown. It's a beautiful museum. It's a Julia Morgan building. It is stunning and it'll tell you the story of um, the beginning of Chinatown. So that's a good place to go as well. Um, and I think we have a time for one more question. So I'm going to ask, it's kind of a combination of a couple. Are there any unexpected things that happen when creating this book or do you uh, have a particular memory that you're still fond of when you think back to making this book? Uh, for me, it was uh, that picture of Reverend Fong, Norman Fong, who was formerly the director of the uh, Chinatown Community Development Center that oversees these um, SRO apartment buildings. And I was really touched by him. He's also a rock mu musician, oh, really? and, uh, kind of does it all. And um, everyone in the community knows him. He had so much compassion on the elderly. So I just was really um, impressed, I guess, um, by just all the shopkeepers and all those who live there, they're really, proud of what they do. They don't, they're not ashamed of what they do. And so I, for me, I just gained a new appreciation for the place that I really didn't like when I was a kid. But when I came <laughs> back to the circle, I really loved it again. One overall surprise to me was how open and uh, eager to participate people that people were. Uh, and uh, we did th some things, of course, to try to earn their trust ahead of time. And and uh, use contacts that we had to make introductions for us. But um, of 135 requests for permission to use photos of people or their work, we only had one person turn us down. Wow. And uh, he was not Chinese and did not, not live in Chinatown. <laughs> <laughs> he was a muralist. Uh, but, uh, uh, and there were many examples when we, we would meet someone unexpectedly uh, I think Kathy showed you the uh, woman who is a Sifu or a, uh, a Tai Chi master in the, the pink silk outfit. Uh, well, we discovered her accidentally because she was the wife of the herbalist that we also showed. And we saw some big trophies in the herbal shop and asked where they came from. And uh, they explained that was his wife. And so we met her. And, and then that's how we got a whole series of We've got probably a hundred shots around Chinatown of her uh, in various poses. And maybe one last one is uh, the little girl that I guess Kathy also mentioned doing the calligraphy, uh, Yuhan, who was I think six, maybe five at the time. Uh, 
six years old. Yeah. Yeah. And we met her because we were taking photographs of the uh, Lunar New Year parade and had been invited by the Chinese Culture Center who control the Kearney Street Bridge. Mm. Uh, so I wanted to get shots, like the shot right behind me in my virtual background was taken from the Kearney Street Bridge. Nice. Uh, so uh, I went inside because it's pretty cold out there uh, for a break. And here I see this little girl, six years old, sitting here studiously working on her calligraphy. And it just struck me, this is an image that we have to have. <laughs> So naturally with, with someone of that age, you need to find the parents to get permission. Right. And fortunately her mother uh, was hosting a group of clients uh, there for the parade. Uh, her mother is a, a banker, a wealth banker of his clients. So we found her, we got permission to take the photos. And then uh, Yuhan has become in a way a bit of a iconic uh, signature image uh, for the Chinatown. How beautiful. I love that intergenerational, you know, you have the, the younger folks learning the calligraphy and learning the language being really engaging with the culture. That's, that's so beautiful. I, I really thank you guys so much for sharing so much about Chinatown and about your process. And I think I, I'll speak for myself, but I know I'm jotting down notes of, okay, this is where I need to go visit, right? I think <laughs> many of us are probably putting together an agenda. <laughs> For where to explore in Chinatown. That's definitely me too. I have I have yeah. the places well, written down. And one thing you can do is is if you have the book, uh, or go buy the book, <laughs> and in it we've tried to identify all the locations. So if you you know if you see locations of murals or restaurants or things, typically uh, in the bibliography we'll have identified the location, and you can go visit a number of those uh, sites that are in the book or online on the website as well. Um, and I just linked it back again. So folks that are here watching, uh, there's a direct link and you can pop it open uh, maybe after the event is over and check out the wonderful, wonderful book. I wanna thank uh, Richard, Kathy, um, also Allie for co-hosting with me. And I know Laura was uh, sharing the images from your book. So thank you so much for putting this presentation together. Um, and yeah, it was very informative and thank you for all those great recommendations too. I appreciate you sharing your stories with us. Thanks for having us. Great, have a wonderful rest of your commu uh, community day. Yeah, well, thank right. you so much for being a part of it. I wanna bring on Rowan um, uh, onto our virtual screen, you know, calling them up onto stage. Um, Rowan is one of our other gallery teachers uh, who's been with the museum for a while. They're a wonderful artist, really great, love looking at their sketchbook all the time, uh. Um, uh, particularly in printmaking and relief printing. So if we ever get to do some workshops in person, hopefully we can uh, weave those in. Uh, what do you think of the presentation, Rowan? Yeah, thanks, Radhika, for bringing me on. Thank you, Dick and Kathy, for um, the beautiful insights of uh, the historical and modern day experiences of Chinatown. It was really delightful to hear the stories behind each of those images. Um, I especially love the photo of the kiddo eating dragon spear candy. <laughs> I love dragon spear candy. It's so delicious and so messy too. I remember the first time I had it um, was in Seoul, South Korea when I was studying there. And there was an arts and crafts district where you could go and watch the artists craft the candy. And it's such a it's such an intriguing process. The way they stretch out that syrup. Um, so cool. It's I, like a ballet in the air. air. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Totally. It, yeah, they're like, you know, you think um, how people uh, spin dough, you know, like pizza artists. Yeah, they're doing their whole, whole thing with how they stretch it and spin it. Really cool. But um, yeah, I'm super excited for our next segment. Radhika, do you want to? Yes, um, we have Oliver Chin ready on deck. Um, we're moving a couple of minutes uh, a little bit late, so I appreciate his patience as we're getting ready to move on uh, to his live book reading on the Year of the Ox. I'm so excited. I'm also going to drop um, an interactive kind of uh, worksheet or teaching aid that you can follow along with. It's really fun, um, but I'm going to hand it over to Oliver right now. Okay, thanks very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right, so... 
That was a very fascinating talk. Thanks for sharing that. So again, my name is Oliver Chin. I'm a children's book author in San Francisco, and I'm happy to join the San Jose Museum of Art today to share our latest in our series of stories on each of the animals of the new year. So uh, we've done all 12, so we're going to just do a quick run through. We've done uh, Teddy the Tiger, uh, Rosie the Rabbit, Dominic the Dragon, Susie the Snake, Hannah the Horse, Sydney the Sheep, Max the Monkey, uh, Ray the Rooster, Daniel the Dog, Patty the Pig, and last year, or last day was Thursday, was uh, Ralph the Rat. So uh, today we'll be reading together The Year of the Ox, and the last few editions we've done bilingual in simplified Chinese. So I'd like to share my screen, and then at, maybe after the reading, uh, again, we can do some Q&A. All right, so here we go. All right, so everyone see the year of the ox right there? Great, all right, so uh, for those of you guys at home or if you're a kid with a lot of energy, you guys can help me out and share at home the sound effect for Olivia. Uh, she's the main character and this is her best friend, May. So as an ox, an ox is sort of like a cow and you all know what a cow says in stories. Uh, at the count of three, we can practice, and uh, you can help me out with Olivia's cow sound. We'll go one, two, three. Moo! All right, fantastic. Moo. All right, so uh, just pretend you're in second grade. It goes over really well when I visit schools and libraries. So we'll keep going. And the theme of the story is how a little person, or in this case, an ox, grows up just like a boy or girl. and over the years, we've had six female characters and six male characters, and they meet friends of all the other animals too, and people as well. But it's up to them to blaze their own trail and discover who they are and what they'd like to become, just like we all have to do. So my friend Jeremiah Alcorn, he is the artist. He drew the characters for the dog, pig, rat, and ox years. He's an animator. He lives in Birmingham, Alabama, and he has uh, contributed to shows such as uh, DuckTales. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Light glistened off the morning dew and the rising sun welcomed another day. Inside the stables, Mama and Papa Ox yawned. After a long night, resting in their bed of hay, they tickled their new baby. Oh, coochie, coochie, coo. It was a long night, but it was worth it. Mama smiled, hello there, honey. Only a few hours old, the youngster was rustling about already. Russell, Russell. She had a sweet and peaceful manner, so Papa suggested, hey, let's call her Olivia. All right, great idea, Dad. The proud parents introduced the calf to their friends. Oh, hello there, hi. She'll be a big gal, they all agreed. Mama whispered, honey, Tomorrow you'll meet the farmer's daughter. Her name is May. Okay. During her first visit, the girl petted Olivia and combed her hair. Oh, I know we'll be best friends, smiled May, and she adopted Olivia as her little sister. Oh, the grateful heifer, which means cow, promised, oh, I'll always look out for you. <laughs> Sharing a bubbly spirit, the girls played tag, hide and seek, and kick the can, doink. In the countryside, the pair loved to stop and smell the roses, but sometimes their wild wandering would make quite a mess. Oh, they need a bath now. Afterwards, Olivia's parents took her aside. Mama noted, there's a time and place for fun and games. Papa added, yes, dear. It's about time you learn to pull your own weight around here. Hmm, what does that mean? <laughs> the following morning, Papa and Mama showed her the shed. Oh, it's over here. Where they got ready for work. Every day, the bull and cow would each carry a yoke. Not that 
yellow thing instead of an egg. It's this wooden harness they put on their shoulders and pull a plow. Oh, they're helping farm the land there. Olivia wanted to pitch in despite Mama's misgivings. Oh, Papa pointed out, hey, Olivia, but the yoke is heavy. Not the egg, this, this big wooden thing. And tilling the ground is hard labor. Olivia boasted, yeah, I'm a big girl now and I can handle it by myself. Oh, you think she can carry this big wooden yoke? She has <laughs> it's bigger than her. But try as she might, Olivia was too small to plow the fields. Oh, many times she got stuck in the mud and had to be rescued. Okay, you guys at home, help me out with Olivia's sound here. One, two, three. Oh, fantastic audience participation. After a long day, Olivia came home dirty and plum tuckered out. Oh, it's nine to five. No fun for kids. After dinner, Mama advised, dear, maybe you could try a different job. Yes, I'd like that very much, answered Olivia eagerly. All right, she is ready for the next chore. The next day, May led Olivia to the nearby well to fetch some water. Okay, you guys, raise your hand if you've ever drawn water from a well. I assume you all have indoor plumbing, which is good. But these guys don't. They have to go outside and lower a bucket into the earth to get water. <gasps> Gingerly May, the girl, filled her bucket and she balanced it on her head. <gasps> all right, raise your hand if you've ever done that before. I haven't. That's very heavy. Density of water is one. That's pretty heavy. Ah, <laughs> uh, Your little sister, Olivia, she bragged, yeah. I can carry much more than you. Oh, do you believe Olivia? She's never done this before. Do you think she can do that? Uh-oh. Be careful, May warned, as Olivia moseyed along with two buckets on her shoulders. Oh, they were almost home when, who, who did she bump into? Oh, not, not that Kellogg's icon. It's a, it's a real rooster. Oh, it bumped into the rooster, and the rooster crowed cock-a-doodle-doo. Oh, Olivia slipped. Whoop and spilled the water everywhere. <gasps> Splash! Olivia. After cleaning up, May thought of another tour for Olivia. Hey, next week is harvest time. You could bring the rice to be milled. <gasps> Olivia nodded and they prepared to collect the crop. You know, they, these guys don't have Costco around. They have to go out to the fields harvest the grain, take the grain to the mill, and shake all those little white kernels out. That's a lot of work. She put on her work gloves down here. During the harvest, May loaded stalks of grain onto Olivia's back. Evo! Oh, this is easy, smirked Olivia. But on the way to the mill, who is this animal? You guys, help me out. What does this animal say? One, two, three. Piss. What does it say? Oh, this snake darted in front of her. Startled, Olivia scattered her load all over the road. Olivia. Now both girls were embarrassed, but the weekend was here. Yay, the weekend. And May's parents had planned to sell their vegetables at the local farmer's market. Raise your hand if you like going to the farmer's market. Yeah, farm to table. Very good. Olivia promised to behave, so Mama and Papa let her come too. Yippee! Oh, there's the farmer's market. The town square bustled with buying and selling, and May's parents displayed their bounty. Oh, so colorful. Looks delicious. Yummy. Olivia marveled at all those sights, sounds, and smells. Then who did she meet? Oh. Who is this? It's a friendly rat. And she followed it to a stall close by. Yeah, you follow me. I have something really, really good to show you. <laughs> Suddenly a yell rang out. Okay, you guys at home, help me out with a big yell. One, two, three. <laughs> oh, so scary. Eek! Oh, soon her crowd had gathered to watch Olivia eat someone's fruit. Oh, I don't think she paid for that. Neighbors wagged their hooves, 
Papa shook his horns and May hurried to drag her pal away. Olivia. After the commotion subsided, Mama moaned, Darling, I guess you're not old enough to help us after all. May and her parents were disappointed too. So Olivia, she trudged back with her tail between her legs. Oh, oh that, is, that is sad. At home, Olivia wanted to prove she was a hard worker. But May's parents had business in town with Mama and Papa. Leaving to tend the fields, May told Olivia, oh, just please stay behind and out of trouble. Do you think that made her friend feel better? I don't think so. Alone with little to do, Olivia vowed, oh, I'll show them Ooh, somehow. Later, she heard a cry pierce the sky. Okay, you guys, we're going to do it again. Give me a big scream. One, two, three. <laughs> so convincing. I have to call 911. As noises suddenly filled the air, Olivia rushed outside. And she couldn't believe her eyes. <gasps> what did she see out there? What was so surprising? Why were people screaming? <gasps> Everyone was running away from the farmland that was quickly flooding. <gasps> the old dam had burst. <gasps> All right, you guys help me out with Olivia's sound again. One, two, three. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Bellowed Olivia. But no one stopped to help. They're running for their lives. Oh, immediately she wondered, oh, where is May? Oh, okay, you guys, raise your hand if you have a brother or a sister. All right, I know you love them very much. What if something bad was happening and they were missing? Oh, would you go search for them? Oh. Hard decision. You love them. Blood's thicker than water. Olivia, she jumped into the rice paddy to search for her sister. Splash! Passersby warned her, oh, leave all you can. But she pressed on against the current and finally spotted May clinging to the branches of a cypress tree. Oh, is she okay? Did I get there in time? When and worried, May was surprised to see Olivia. Oh, what are you doing here? This is no time for questions, Olivia sputtered. Get down and climb on board. Swimming toward home, <laughs> Olivia picked up others stranded by the rising water. Help, help. Hold on, we're coming. Juggling them on her shoulders, Olivia plowed ahead. At last, she clambered over the ridge to safety. Oh, thanks for saving us. Okay, you guys at home, raise your hand if you know how to swim. Comes in very handy, times like this. But before they could catch their breath, oh, they noticed the bank had begun to buckle. I guess it was not FDI. See insured, but that's a story for another day. If it gave way, the water would flood the village below. <gasps> May cried, we need to warn the townsfolk. <gasps> they have no time. <gasps> Hurry up and go, replied Olivia, and she pressed her shoulder against the dike. That's this big wall, retaining wall. Oh, hold it up. May <gasps> Hesitating, May. What did she hop on right here? What is this thing? All right, raise your hand if you guys know how to ride a bike. Oh, that comes in very handy too. She hopped on her bike. I'll pedal as fast as I can, and you'd better still be here when I come back. They made a pinky promise. Leaning against the crumbling wall, Olivia spotted a crack. <gasps> where water began dripping through. She needed to patch it, but didn't dare move. What could she do? Hastily, blop, 
She stuck her tail into the hole. Wow, quick thinking, Olivia. You don't need to be in the Netherlands to do that. The plug held and Olivia sighed in relief. <gasps> Feeling the world's weight on her shoulders, Olivia didn't want to let everybody down. Digging her hose into the ground, she pushed with all her might. You guys help me out one last time. Count of three, one, two, three. No. No. Oh, fantastic. You guys are great. Time crawled by. Just then, May's family and Mama and Papa arrived with lots of helpers. Oh, they're reinforcing the dike there. As the waters finally receded, Olivia took a break. Ooh, she was dirty, soggy, and hungry, but was very happy. Wow. May hugged Olivia. Aww. Thanks for coming back for me. Olivia blushed. I know you do the same. Joyfully, Mama and Papa remarked, Wow, you two are the bravest girls in the whole world. Remember that the earth is round, not flat. It's a big place. Soon life returned to normal, and Olivia and May played their games and roamed about as before. Dink. And hopefully life will return to normal to us soon, and we'll get to visit the museum in all its glory. Their parents watched how they were growing up, both hungry for adventure and strong-willed. These sisters loved each other heart and soul. May knew that Olivia was there for her when it counted, and everyone around would remember that this was a marvelous year of the ox. So I want you guys to give yourselves a big clap for helping me out with all those special sound effects you did. Fantastic. Check is in the mail. All right. So if you know anybody born today or for the next year, a little wee tyke there an ox and these are the qualities that olivia discovered that she had as she lived her life just like we all discover who we are as we persist and resist and continue to do good work out there people born in the year of the ox are patient stout and down to earth they are plain spoken and hard working but sometimes just sometimes they can be creatures of habit cautious and headstrong though they may be slow to rouse oxen are dependable characters indeed and so these are the 12 animals we saw in the story and a new cast for every storybook and the ones that we've done so far. So I'm gonna stop my screen share right now and get back to in living color. And I'm gonna wish you guys a fantastic year of the ox. Remember vitamin C, very good for you. Also reminds people of gold and remember your lucky red see envelopes. It's up to your parents, your mothers and fathers and grandparents out there to, you know, dig into your wallet, share <laughs> the wealth, maybe just a penny and a dollar. But, you know, it's the sim symbolism of it all. And I have a couple of friends I, I'm going to introduce. Oh, this is Ralph from last year. It was not my fault. 2020 was tough. I'm a good guy. And this is Patty here before. Oh, Golden Hose New Year's edition. Hello there. Who do we have here? Oh, Susie. Oh, remember, you don't have to be bogged down by, you know, the Judeo-Christian mythology. Snakes are very, very important and helpful creatures right there. And then, here we go. Oh, don't forget Olivia. Oh, Gold Hoops 2, Chinese New Year edition. Yeah. You hope you enjoyed the story. It was fun, wasn't it? Yeah. Read it at home. Have fun this year. Happy Year of the Ox. Okay, so any questions out there? Um, first of all, thank you, Oliver. That was amazing. I, I've never been more entertained by a, a book reading in my life for, for a children's book reading. I think that was so fun. Um, yeah, I was talking to my co-host and I, I've never been more excited to moo during a story. <laughs> um, so well, I'm, I'm know, glad you- It gets the stress out. Everybody yeah, totally. I, I have a question for you. What inspired you to write write books about the the zodiac? Well, uh, as I like to tell kids when I visit them at schools, it's uh, I owe it to my sons Lucas and Eli. Now they're a little bit older, uh, but back in the day, uh, being a new father and having to go to the library and the bookstore looking at books, you know, it's always a, a trip down memory lane. But uh, it struck me that there's still not very many books with people of color in them, even back in uh, you know. 17 years ago. So that uh, was one of the things we wanted to do. We wanted to create fun stories like, oh, 
the Octonauts here, but we also wanted to create stories which had multicultural characters and a diverse world, which reflects the world that we live in. And for a long time, American publishing was not that way. So we wanted to create some stories like that. And that was the genesis of the idea of the animals of the new year. Uh, of course, we're familiar with them and we've heard one story or two, but it gave us a lot of freedom to create a brand new story for each one of them. That's, that's beautiful. I, I love that representation that you're bringing. Um, we've got some comments that some folks love the Octonauts in all caps. So we've got some fans here. Um, uh, I also want to say I love Patty the pig. Um, I'm the, the boar is my animal or the pig. Oh, my sister's a pig too. I dedicated it to her. Oh, nice. I love that. Um, but yeah, I want to thank you so much. Rowan, do you have any questions or anything? Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, I'm a year of the rat. And so when I saw Olivia swimming across the water, you know, saving all those little animals that were stranded. Oh, that's super cool. Um, and I saw the little rat in there. It reminded me of uh, at least one version of the folklore uh, in which the rat got on the ox. And that's why the rat is the first in the Chinese or in the Zodiac, right? That's right. So that was yeah. the, the common uh, tale, a folk tale, which, you know, is great. And people retell it. Uh, for us, we wanted to kind of go beyond that mix exactly. east and west and the qualities we associate traditionally but the image we have seen here you know growing up of you know bugs bunny and everybody else but just create a, a, a merger of the two and so for us to include that scene you know it's not a competition you know it's a, a collaboration they're all in it together yeah it's fantastic it's super fun um, I want to thank you once more. Um, Oliver, feel free to stick around. I, yeah, I love the illustrations in your book. They just brought me so much joy. Um, and yeah, I'm just looking forward to seeing more of your work and hopefully we can collaborate more through the museum as well. Yeah, we look forward to it. Thank you. All right. Um, folks in the chat, with your reactions, give Oliver Chin some love. Um, oh, thank you so yeah. much for joining us today uh, to celebrate Lunar New Year for our community day. Thank you, Oliver. Perfect, perfect. We've got some things there. If you have any questions for Oliver, put them in the chat. I'm sure he can answer them there too. It's wide open. All right, folks, um, we've been here for a while. I want everyone uh, to kind of, you know, raise your hands, stretch, uh, maybe stand up from your seat because you know what's next. Does anyone know what's next? It's gonna be a dance. We're gonna learn how to dance. And I, I would like to say I'm a good dancer, but I think it's just that I'm very overconfident uh, and I like music. So, uh, but we, oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but we have a wonderful dance by the Korean Cultural Center Urusawe where we're gonna see um, a Salpuri dance and they'll explain um, the history behind it. And then they will walk us through this tutorial. Um, so take a second to stand up, get some space around you uh, and get in, the, get in the mindset to move. All right, folks. I'm gonna share the video in just a second and then I'll confirm with y'all if you can hear the sound okay too. All right, right now. Hello, we are KCCU Urisawi. Korea Culture Center Urisawi was founded in 2002 by the group of people dedicated to bringing awareness of Korean dance, music, and culture. Since the foundation, we have been serving the Bay Area with highest quality of performances and lessons of Korean culture. The dance we are covering today is called Salpuri. The meaning of salpuri is a combination of two words, sal and puri. Sal, it represents the bad luck, and puri, it represents the act of release or removal. Combining the two words, salpuri is a dance act that is removing or releasing the bad luck.
I'm just pausing here for a brief moment to say, this is where you get up out of your seat. You can turn your cameras off. I understand being self-conscious, but I want everyone um, to practice removing that bad energy from their lives or whatever maybe is bogging you down. So take a second to stand up and we'll go into the second half, which is the tutorial. All right, folks. <laughs> We will now learn steps and motions of Salpuri. First, when we step forward, we will lift the heels of our feet and step forward. Next, we will start with both hands forward. While lowering both hands, take the towel to the right hand, then bring the right hand up to the ear level, then roll the hand towards the outside. Let's try together. First, we will lower the towel. Ready? Roll the hand. Step forward with right foot as we raise our right hand. One, step. Two, step. Three, four. Now take your hand. One, two, three, four, down to the shoulder level. Now we will perform the towel throw. Towel throw will start at the shoulder level and we'll throw the towel towards the other side by making an arc. For the hand that is throwing the towel to the other side, we'll make a movement as if our hand is across our chest and then lower the hands to the other side. Let's try now. We'll hold the towel up and take four steps. Following the four steps, we will now throw the towel to the other side. Next, while we retrieve the towel back to its original side, we will have the towel slide over the left hand naturally and bring the towel up to the chest level with both hands. When we bring up the towel with both hands, we will raise the left hand a bit higher, creating an offset. We'll try this now again. Step forward, two, three, four, and throw the towel. Slide and lift. Now, when previous steps are done, we will turn to the right side, slowly. Next step, we will lower the towel with both hands and we'll twirl the towel toward the front by snapping the hands. One, two, one, two. After the turn and the towel twirl, we will go backwards. One, two. We're not just making a back step, but rather sweeping our feet on the ground. Not lifting our feet from the ground. Remember to shift your weight towards back. While stepping backwards, we'll twirl the towel on both sides. One, two. We'll now try this together. One, two, one, two. Now we will perform the finishing motion. One, two, spin, and finishing motion. Right foot forward and left hand down. We have gone through the few steps of Saipuri. I hope it was helpful. Thank you.
Um, I hope everyone got a chance to try that. Uh, that was beautiful. Uh, I felt I felt kind of like I was releasing the, the bad energy. And I want to thank um, the Korean Cultural Center Uresawe for putting that together and for also putting together the tutorial that followed along with it. Um, I saw you try it out too, Rowan. How did, how did you feel the dance went? Yeah, I might have to do a little bit more uh, practice on that, but all the more the better, right? Let's get, let's get ready to embrace the year with a lighter spirit, less negative energy moving forward. I think it was beautiful. It was a really stunning performance. So thank you, Uresawe. Um, I, hear, I see some of the comments as well as like folks are feeling lighter. So I'm glad other people tried it out as well. Um, and I want to encourage you to give thanks to KCC Urasawe um, in the chat or with your reactions to just so they can feel the love that you've been spreading around this entire event um, as we move on to our last program of the day. Um, our last program is going to be our wonderful cooking uh, tutorial. It's going to feature a video um, and some more kind of tips and information. Uh, you might recognize uh, the, the lead or the host of, of this program. It's Tarami Kron. She was here earlier today leading our wonderful poetry workshop. Um, and she'll be here again to help close out this wonderful community day event at San Jose Museum of Art for celebrating Lunar New Year. Um, so uh, Tarami, uh, as mentioned before, uh, is part of Chopsticks Alley and it really celebrates um, Vietnamese culture and art and sharing that with the folks uh, in the San Jose area and beyond. Um, so we're so happy to have you back here, Tarami. It's good to start the day with you and I'm really excited to end it with you as well. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to you and we'll we'll get started. Thank you so much and welcome to Chopsticks Alley's Kitchen. This is my home kitchen in the middle of San Jose. It's country-like. You can like chop up banana leaves, you know, like those videos, those YouTube videos. <laughs> so, you know, I'm kidding, right? So this is actually a, a kitchen in Vietnam. I was able to find this beautiful image to give you this feeling and this sense of, um, you know, what is it like during Lunar New Year or that New Year? The point is to get together. And what do you do when you get together besides eating is cooking food. So when you think of the making tamales tradition of the Mexican culture, it's similar to that. Mm -hmm. So we would spend all night, men too, men and women and children get together, make these cakes, cook it all night long in this huge pot in an open fire because it does take like 12 hours to make. And, um, you know, and during that time is when they reconnect because they may have not seen each other all year um, if they're going back home to the countryside and they, you know, start connecting, telling stories and usually the elders continue with like, oh, when I was your age, you know, passing on certain traditions. So we love this. Ban um, is what these little cakes are called. And um, before we begin all that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Chopsticks Alley and then tell you um, a, a legend and how these cakes came to be. So Chopsticks Alley and Chopsticks Alley Art, um, I'm the executive director and we are a nonprofit promoting Southeast Asian cultural heritage through the shared expression of art to foster greater understanding, support and celebration among individuals with differing abilities, the LGBTQ community, elders and the young and the young at heart, of course. Um, we also have a publication. It's a multimedia platform where we empower Vietnamese and Filipino Americans to share their cultural trends and, and tell stories of the leaders. Um, today, I'm supposed to have um, my partner in crime, Alin Nguyen, who is um, supposed to be joining us. Oh, I see Alin now. She's um, getting on. So as she's taking care of that, I'm just going to continue. All right. All right. Let's talk about the story of Ban Tung and ban ye. So ban ye is a different cake, but we're not making that today. So back, you know, a long, long time ago, far in a land far, far away called Annam, <laughs> which is now known as Vietnam, there was a king. His name was King Hom. So he wanted to choose one son as a successor. He, of course, had many wives and so many sons, but he wanted to choose one who was, would be well-deserving of his throne. 
So he summoned all of his children, all the sons, and told them that whoever could bring him the most precious offering for the ancestors, the altar, the, he will um, give them the throne because they'll be, sh you know, showing their pious feelings, not only for him, um, but also for the ancestors. So the winner will get the throne. So ta -da -da, you know, here we go. So the princes traveled throughout the country in search of the tastiest and most exotic things and foods to offer to, to their father. And except one, so the 18th prince, his name is uh, Lang Liu, he was the poorest amongst the prince. And he thought, you know, he's not going to be able to compete with his brothers to buy the most luxurious food or the most expensive things. So he kept searching and searching. One night, he dreamt, so he had a dream. And of course, poof, there was a genie, of course, right? But our genie, you know, he's an old haired man wearing the traditional outfit and he's got this little wand, you know, all these wonderful things, very different from like Cinderella, right? So he, um, the genie came and told him, there is nothing greater than the sky or the earth. And the rice grain is the most precious thing in the world. Now use galnep or gluttonous rice to make banjung. It's a green and square cake symbolizing the earth. Because you know, back then they thought the earth was square. Okay. It will be made with a filling called dao san or <laughs> mung beans and meat symbolizing the plants and the animals living on earth. You will use green leaves to cover the cake, symbolizing the services rendered by parents to their children. Then use ground gluttonous rice to make ban yai, which is the other cake. It's a white dome-shaped cake symbolizing the sky. So, of course, the prince woke up and he was so happy to prepare these cakes. So on the day of the contest, the king examined all the offerings that his son brought. He was not really satisfied, but then he came to the cakes that Lang Liu offered. So when he saw the cake symbolizing such humbleness, yet represents the heart of the Vietnamese people, of course he won, right? So he became the ultimate king, he got the throne, and we live happily ever after, as you can imagine. <laughs> so with that, we would like to um, have Radhika show you this how we make the cakes and then afterwards you know we'll answer all your questions and we can fill in some of the blanks okay so radica if you're ready let's go right. and i encourage folks to just turn up the volume on whatever device you're uh listening in on uh just so you can hear it at the best quality um but i'll play the video right now Let's begin to make bunting together. This recipe is brought to you by Tommy Crone and Ali Nguyen. And let's begin. This is your final product. Isn't it beautiful? So to begin, you're going to need some banana leaves, which you can buy in the frozen section, some twine or string to hold the cakes together. And these are cake molds that you can purchase online. And then a pestle and mortar to crush those peppers. This is sticky rice. You're going to rinse the sticky rice. You're gonna need some salt. And this is the rice all nice and drained. And this is mung bean that you can buy pre-peeled from the Asian stores. And you're going to also give them a quick rinse. As part of the prep, you're going to stir fry some thinly sliced shallots that you will mix with the mung bean. So now you're going to use your cake mold to measure out how you're going to cut the leaves. Notice we want to cut them um, along the grain, so not against the grain, if you will. So you're going to put in two leaves that you already cut up in uh, like a cross section. And then you're going to also align the cakes all around with the thinner strips that you also pre-cut. This recipe is good for about 25 cakes. Then you're gonna scoop some sticky rice in there and then layer it with a little bit of the mung bean. 
These are participants from our live class, which were offered in early 2020. And then you're gonna add some pre-marinated pork belly in there to add some of that nice pork fat. And then another layer of the mung bean. And we do flavor the mung bean as well as the sticky rice with a little salt to give them flavoring. And here you go, that's what they would look like all up close. <laughs> you can see the excitement in our participants' faces when they do this. And then finally, you're gonna top the cake again with another layer of the sticky rice. And then fold it over um, press it down so that everything is sealed nice and tight. You, even little kids can do this. So anybody can do this together. It's a great way to bring families together, um, an event right before the Lunar New Year and create something fun together. And of course, delicious. And it's a great way to pass on this wonderful tradition for Vietnamese families. In the olden days, or in Vietnam, we don't have pressure cookers. So usually we spend all night making these cakes, sharing, sharing stories, and then cook the cakes all night long in uh, over the stovetop in a big fire that they usually make in the yard. And so then you're gonna pull out the cakes from the mold and you're going to wrap it with the twine. So you're gonna make like a crisscross tie so that way we can keep all of the leaves together and you can use any string really you know any for cooking or these are special ones you can buy in the Asian store for making these cakes are made out of um, a plastic string it's good for cooking because it's um, pretty sturdy it doesn't feel yucky at the end so that's what it looks like before cooking. Then you're gonna put them back in the mold, right? So this is a pressure cooker that you're gonna cook in the soup mode. It's gonna take a while for the water to heat up. And in the soup mode, you set it at 45 minutes. And you put all the cakes in there and here they are ready to go and coming out. You see how the cake molds help keep the cakes Together. So you don't want to put too much stuffing in there because everything will expand. <laughs> and this is what the cakes look like once you cook them. And we're cutting it up to try it. And we like a lot of black pepper, so you can see there. Lots of black pepper. <laughs> You can see all the different uh, layers there. And it's just delicious. Here's a, our taste testers. She says it's really good and tastes authentic. And there you have it. We wish you a happy new year and thanks for joining us today. And thank you San Jose Museum of Art for letting us have our little workshop to show you how to make fun you. These are images of how they are served. I love all the comments in the, the chat. Um, so we're gonna sh share a little bit more detail in person here. So that way, um, you know, it makes a little more sense. Hi, Alin, thanks for joining us today. Um, you're on mute. So while you unmute yourself, I'm gonna share with the audience. Um, you can buy banana leaves. Um, so the virtual screen is like, uh, <laughs> Background to it works. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can see it, which you can't, because uh, of me. Oh, there it is. Look, look at that. It's in the foot. You can see that now. Section. Okay. And Aline's going to show you a couple more props that we have. 
Okay. Can everyone see? This is the mung bean that you can get from the market. Most of the Asian market would carry this, and it comes in the one with coloring and without coloring. So try to look for the one without coloring, which is better. And I want to show, and these are the strings that we would use to tie the end product at the end. But one of the things that I want to mention that is so important when you mix the mung beans with the shallot, and this is the key that brings all the aroma together. So be sure that you keep in mind when you cooking the shallot, and I'll show you the differences. This is the color that you want. You see how golden, but just lightly golden. You do not want it to get it all burnt like this. Uh -uh. <laughs> not uh -uh. good if it's burnt. No, Start again. no, no. <laughs> right. Because then it, it, it changes the colors of the mung bean. So you want to keep it lightly golden. And the key to do that is when you heat up the oil, let it heat up really well, and then turn off the heat. And then you cook the shallot. That way it keeps that golden look for you because the heat still retain in there. That's all we need. Yes. Is there anything else you want to show our audience or? And just so, cause I don't know if you get to see the shallot, but this is the color of the little shallot that you want. Okay, so you peel that off, you cut it up and then you would fry it to come out like this. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna show everyone the mold. So if you, um, you know, Google, whatever, these are like, you know, like mousse molds, right? To make, and you can buy bigger size. I imagine if you follow the recipe, by the way, if you, know, if you didn't catch it on the video, we use a pressure cooker. So it only took 45 mm -hmm. minutes to make. So if you're gonna make a thicker cake or a bigger cake than this size, then you probably need to add a little bit uh, longer cooking time. And you do not want the mm -hmm. pressure cooker mode because you're gonna blow right. up your cake, right? Pressure, yeah. <laughs> right? So slow. Um, but even then, it, it only takes 45 minutes. Traditionally, it will be all night long. And one other tip is do not fast or quick release because when you do that, it will the mm -hmm. cakes will also burst, right? So just yes. let it, you have this patience, you know. And the idea is you get all your friends and family together. You sit around and you know, on the video, you saw Alin and, and Mai and, um, you know, our, our elderly family because they're like watching us fascinated that we can make this in mm -hmm. 45 minutes. So when she opened the cake, you know, everyone's like, "Woo! <laughs> it looks so good, right? Um, One thing I want to also share to Trami, um, we can always, um, if you, when you buy the banana leaves, leave it as frozen and wash them well, wipe them well, and then you can freeze it ahead of time, trim them all in good size that we need ahead of time. So when you're ready to do this, it won't be so tedious. It will be fun. Um, so to answer some of our uh, folks questions here, so Linda wanted to know if we cook everything first um, and so you don't, all everything's raw, you just mm -hmm. make sure you rinse the rice clean, you rinse the mung bean clean, you marinate your pork, um, you do cook the shallots only because then you mm -hmm. have that stir fry yeah. taste right, but yeah. other than it, that, that aroma. Mm -hmm. Everything's raw and the rice cook, you know, the pressure cooker takes care of all of it. And I also, for those um, earlier, someone asked like, how do you make it if you don't have a mold? Well, mm -hmm. there's this other shape. So the square shape um, pretty much started in the North, I guess, or South too, but the South picked mm -hmm. on this cylindrical shape. So yeah. you can make this easily, um, you know, by hand. So you just make it, it's like folding, you know, making a, like a gift. You fold the bottom, you fill it with rice, you know, so this is the other shape. So, yeah. so pretty much adding to that, if you don't have the mold, uh, like Trami is showing, so you can roll the, the, the uh, banana leaves along with the long grain, they will become um, long shaped like that. Yeah, so you see, this is pork and we like the fat, you know, think of bacon fat, that's the idea. So this fat here will melt into the mung bean. And then um, this one, I love, you know, I just had this right be before I came on. <laughs> So I'm pretty full. Have them. Yes. And then what's really cool is, you know, these cakes are huge. You can't eat it all at once. So you can freeze it and you can also fry it because that's the other thing. I can't eat that much sticky steam rice cake every day. Right. Because um, you kind of celebrate that for like a whole week. Right, Alin? Yes. Right? 
and so <laughs> recourse me all day <laughs> right the same thing over and over and gain a lot of yes. weight um but anyway so you can fry these but yeah um so this is what uh, both Alin and I made the cakes um this this year and you can add a label and I know that SJMA teaches how to make prints right mm -hmm. um so chopsticks alley we've done that too so we've taught folks how to make prints and you can put the you know personalize them like this one I actually cheated I took an old um red envelope lucky money on there and there I you cut go. it there right? you go. I cut it and I <laughs> stuck it on here and then I wrap mm -hmm. it in plastic only to preserve that moisture and it doesn't dry out in the fridge but you can totally freeze this no issues whatsoever um, I do want to introduce Alin a little bit. Um, Alin is a wellness advocate and a certified essential oil specialist for over 10 years. Her focus is bringing healthier ways of life through Vietnamese cooking by incorporating essential oils. So do you add essential oil to this um, cake? In fact, I did on the, the final munching that I made yesterday just for my family. I did actually add it a drop, um, two drops of, of each of a uh, black pepper. So black you know pepper. how we, yes. So in the uh, recipe, we asked for coarse um, black pepper, whole black pepper instead of the grind one because the whole coarse black pepper actually bring a whole lot of aroma when we cook it in the instant pot. So that's the key. But um, instead of adding that, cause it can be a little bit spicy, so I added the black pepper essential oil in my bunching instead. Nice. So it's something different. So the, the pressure cooking part doesn't, you don't lose a flavor from? No, 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 because it's fully wrapped. And um, if you, if everyone follow the recipe that we listed, uh, if you notice, we do wrap the, there's another line of uh, banana leaves that we wrap inside. What it does is that it helps you retain uh, the water inside. So then when you cook, it doesn't get, once you it's done, it doesn't get all soggy. And that's the key that you want it thick, firm, but nice feel to it. Yeah, and you know, they, I have to say the homemade ones are so much better. I don't know why. <laughs> Yes, like I'm sure the cooking is the same. I just don't understand why they're better. Do you know? Is it so, it's love? <laughs> cooking from love? Yes, it's love. It is love. And one of the main ingredients that I find that is so, so unique in our recipe, we don't call for MSG or flavor enhancer. And I think that that makes a big difference. Um, and you could tell it's in the mung bean after it's done cooking when you get to enjoy it. The taste is very different. And I encourage everyone to give it a try. Give it a try one time and, and see, because it's like I had, you know, before this, Tremi and I was just talking one day, we want to have a class. We want to be able to show people the way how we might make munching. And I came to realize when we start working together and creating this recipe of our own, it's amazing. And these are the, the flavor that my grandma used to teach me when I was little, but you know, when you were little, you don't, you didn't pay attention. But now it's the key of how you bring everything together. And when you get to make it homemade, it's wonderful. Yeah, the, you know, the video you saw is actually from a workshop that Chopsy mm -hmm. Sally put together in uh, January 2020, so a year ago. Yes. <laughs> and oh my gosh, you should have seen like the kids making it with yes. their family, right? Yes. It's like this amazing um, connection that they have. And it's so easy to make. You can't mess it up, you know? So if, if the mung bean bleeds a little into the rice, who cares, right? The point is that it's mm -hmm. like you're doing it together. And we saw, like, yes. we had the survey out and everyone was like, yeah, I'm totally doing it. And, you know, on social media, our little post is blowing up because people really want to carry on this tradition. Thank you, Aline, mm -hmm. for sharing with us, you know, a story of your grandma. Now, not everyone grew up with a grandma that makes these because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just bought ours. I felt know? very blessed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we lived in, in Saigon in the city. So we didn't have this, this kitchen with like the leaves. You know, we didn't have all that. I, I, look, my grandma doesn't even iron. Okay. So I don't know how to oh. iron. Not every Vietnamese <laughs> woman is all like, you know, all this, you know, like Alin. Like Alin's like the perfect ultimate woman, married material, oh. you know, that whole thing. <laughs> 
But you know, I we actually grew up in Saigon, but we actually had this big old pot. We just placed it right in front of our house and, wow. and you know, with a few wood uh, brick blocks, stack it up and then there we go. We have our stove <laughs> right in well, front of the house. Did that, right? They just put yes, out the yeah. So it's like a whole fiasco, the entire neighborhood on the 20th or the 30th, a, a day before the new year. What? And we all start cooking all along the neighborhood. And it's oh. so unique because you know, normally by 10 o'clock, everyone locked their doors and closed. But these are the time that little kids like me uh, before, we actually get to stay up with the adult. We get to stay up with the grandparents watching this whole process. It's like eight, nine hours long. But we, you know, that was the only chance that I actually said, I'm glad I was able to stay up with them and, and be able to enjoy it. And, and, you know, looking back now, all of those memories that I wish I could do that with my kids, but now we have the instant pot, <laughs> which is oh, yeah, makes instant life pot. so much easier. Ruin everything. Well, I'm imagining it like Chopsticks mm -hmm. Alley, right? Maybe we're gonna like have everyone line up in Little Saigon. There's a lot of Vietnamese communities. We we should like pick a time and date, and have everybody go outside and cook their own bánh chưng in front. I'm just saying, right? You have to get a permit for that, Tremi, and, I, and make it possible. No. <laughs> Gosh, not if you cook your own food and eat it yourself. You just happen to be outside. Right. <laughs> Everybody else at the same time. It was not planned. <laughs> I think we can make it happen if we get, um, you know, mm -hmm. those Korean, uh, you know, pop, what do you call them? Korean drama? No, those Korean pop stars. What do you call those? Anyways, they can oh. make, they put it on TikTok and then everybody does it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should do that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any other last thoughts for our audience before we wrap up our very easy cakes? Are there any more questions that we missed? I don't think. Yes. Um, I'd like to add a little bit. So on the um, final products, when you remove the um, bánh chưng from the instant pot, you need to make sure that you have a, a readily uh, a cold uh, bucket of water cold water and soak bunching in there for a good 10 to 15 minutes. What it does is that because when you remove that from the instant pot, the heat uh, tends to dry up the leaves really quick. So by soaking um, bunching in the cold water, it retains the color of the leaves also and it keeps that nice moisture and then you just wipe that clean and then wrap that in the saran wrap to keep it um, good for a few days so then the leaves doesn't look all whitish. It still has that we green color to it mm, okay. very good tip thank you for that um yeah let's see what else i guess that's it so oh one one quick thing you can see the image behind me that's a banana leaf right there's yeah. a right side and a wrong side if you will like clothes like this outside and the inside so the outside smooth part that renders the color green so you want that to touch the cake Right, so that way the sticky rice looks green on the outside. And then you also want it on the outside of the cake so that it looks green on the outside. That's why we layer the, the different mm -hmm. layers. So yeah. the right side out to show your best to the world and then the right side in to color mm -hmm. yourself you know, green, right? So we want you to- There you go, you have a good out. point. <laughs> so I refer to that as face up and face down. <laughs> So when you, when you start cutting, you know, trimming the banana leaves and prepping it, just remember the bottom face down and then face up. So then you hold all the grains when you wrap everything together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was, that's our class. Thank you so much, um, SJMA, for letting us be a part of your community day. And, you know, just really quick about the year of the ox, right? So if you know uh, uh, people who are of the Year of the Ox, you know that they are reliable and they also mm -hmm. value their friends. And that's how we feel about San Jose Museum of Art. Chopsticks Alley is a friend for life um, with the San Jose Museum of Art. And another trait is that the Ox has strength, reliability, fairness, and conscientiousness, as well as inspiring confidence in others. So we hope that you take this year to inspire others to do great and amazing things. And we wish you a happy new year. Chúc mừng năm mới and khung hỷ phát trời. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>
And I would like to um, take a quick moment to thank everyone joining us today. And uh, it is my pleasure to have Jimmy, uh invited me to this uh, Benjun workshop. It's an honor, really. I've never thought I'll be able to share with everyone creating something that is so homey, that is so um, close to my heart, being able to witness that whole process with my grandma when we were in Vietnam. And here we are, we sharing that recipe around the world and with everyone in our neighborhood now. So thank you. Thank you everyone for your time. And chúc mừng năm mới, wishing everyone a prosperous new year and a happy, healthy new year to 2021. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, Am I unmuted? Good. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chami and I, Lynn. Uh, Lynn. Um, I do you ever have the thing where you're smiling too much and your face hurts? That's what I'm experiencing right now. Uh, <laughs> this this whole day was really amazing, um, and you you sharing that recipe um, and how it connects to your family and your ancestors and how you're going to bring that on to the future was really meaningful. Um, and it made me very hungry. So I'm excited to try it out. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, folks, this is the end of our virtual community day, Lunar New Year. Um, thank you so much for celebrating the start of the year, the Ox with San Jose Museum of Art and all of our wonderful community partners. Um, I was so glad to see all of you as attendees throughout the day, whether you're joining in just now or you've been with us since this morning. Um, and participating uh, and celebrating and supporting each other. Um, I want to give a big thank you to everyone on the lineup that helped bring our annual event together um, into this virtual space. I know it's a little bit different than when we we're in the museum, um, but I feel like everyone just caught up and didn't miss a beat. Um, the last folks I want to thank also, which let me just bring them on to, to camera so you can see their wonderful faces, uh, are my wonderful co-hosts. Um, Ali Fitch, Rowan Buntempo, and Shannon Straub, who helped me facilitate this event between acts and preparing for it and rehearsing it and making sure that I was calm and happy throughout the day uh, and while preparing for it. So I want to thank them so much. They're wonderful people and wonderful gallery teachers and artists. Um, so big thanks to them too. Uh, thank you to the audience, you know, pat yourself on the back for participating, doing a great job. Um, and then once more, thank you again. Uh, please check out our Facebook page if you want to review any part of uh, the event. Again, it's all recorded there and we'll upload it to YouTube too if you want to revisit any of the fun moments. Um, we hope that you stay safe and you spread kindness and respect to everyone uh, and we'll see you next time and happy new year. Um, yay! And the final thing I'd like to share is I know our director Sayer shared a few works, uh, words on the horrific uh, violence that's facing our Asian community right now. And I want to just end it um, by reinforcing that San Jose Museum of Art has, doesn't condone any discrimination or violence. And I want to make sure that, you know, the folks participating here or watching this video uh, take away to spread peace and kindness to one another as they, they move through the year. All right, folks? So I'm gonna share this last bit, um, but feel free to trickle out. If you have any other questions, feel free to use the chat. I'll leave it open for a moment, um, but thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone on. who attended and performed. Come on you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Tommy, I am so hungry. <laughs> no, I'm <Yeah>. Lynn. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> and definitely. I'm definitely gonna try making those rice cakes. They look amazing. Yes, yes. yes. make some bunch <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, folks. I'm gonna end the event. Enjoy your weekend. Have a great new year. Bye, folks. Bye bye.